So hello and welcome to the first session of the Age of Computational Desire Towards a New History of Culture in the 2020s. By 2005, postmodernism had outlived its usefulness as a theoretical concept for understanding the present time. Instead, others suggested network culture and metamodernism as new frameworks to understand a period in which the internet became central to everyday life, culture, and economy. By 2010, it was clear to thinkers interested in the subject that network culture would last a decade, after which a new constellation would take hold. This seminar sketches the technological outlines of the post-COVID era. Old corporate models of network culture characterized by the five most prominent global technology corporations, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, are decaying. Cryptocurrencies are questioned and devalued as we see the rapid rise of various forms of artificial intelligence that, as yet, have no capacity for inherent cognition, but uncannily predict the relationship of immediately adjacent of related elements. This seminar probes the consequences of these transformations, tracking how the very structure of networks transformed political forms and discourses. The seminar asks, can a new political order be constructed around these shifting technological structures? What will these new eras, markets, and economies look like? Cassis Van Ellis is a Lithuanian and American transdisciplinary artist and historian, working at junctures of art, technology, architecture, sound, and the environment, where he completed his dissertation on the role of the spectacle in the production of form and persona in the architecture of the 70s. Holding a PhD in the history of architecture and urban development from Cornell University, he taught for 25 years at schools of architecture, including SciArc and Columbia University, where he served as director of the Network Architecture Lab. He's a founding member of the architecture program at University of Limerick, Ireland, and co-founder of AUDC. He's also a passionate advocate of the environment and rewilding, currently serving as head of head of advocacy at the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. His books include Blue Monday, Networked Publics, and The Infrastructural City. He has maintained a blog at www.barnellis.net since 1998. His artwork has been displayed in shows at high desert test sites, the New Museum, and the Museum of Modern Art, and was the subject of Detachment, a major solo exhibition at the Contemporary Arts Center in Vilnius, Lithuania in 2016. So, Kazis, please take it away. Hey, uh, thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to just start by thanking um, the organizers uh, at the New Center, uh, uh, Mo, Raphael, Zeno, uh, Nick, Ed, and Carla, and everyone else who helped make this happen. Uh, this is actually the first time in five years I've been teaching. And um, the only reason I'm doing it is because I'm interested. Um, so uh, it's great to have this opportunity. Um, I just realized that my my I made one mistake, which is my screens are going to be swapped because of the way things are laid out. And the other thing is when I actually do do a presentation, it's going to be a little hard for me to see the chat. Um, hopefully that's OK. Um, you know, if there's anything, um, I'll figure that out for next time because I haven't actually done a PowerPoint where there's a chat going on. But um, we'll see. I'll keep swapping in. So, uh, you know, do interrupt if there's like any issues, like in terms of sound or any weird glitches and stuff like that, all right? <clears throat> um, the other thing I'm just going to mention at the outset is I've been sort of battling um, allergies and other sort of issues. So my voice is actually just a little bit worse than usual at the moment, um, and hopefully it'll last um, last throughout uh, throughout today's thing here. So, okay, uh, let's go with trying screen share. I'm going to have to immediately um immediately swap the uh the screens so we're going to do this or maybe not even 
let's see. So if you see, you should be able to see that. And with that in mind, then we should be okay. I don't even need this thing. So I should actually, hmm, well, that's interesting. I see you, which is kind of amusing. I see all of you, but then uh, I don't actually see that. And maybe I can see the chat. Maybe we'll see. I don't know. Um, again, you know, first time for doing a new center project, which is like a big deal about teaching for the first time in five years is uh, I don't think anyone in my knowledge, to my knowledge, was teaching. Um, I mean, anybody I knew was teaching using Zoom uh, five years ago, if it really even existed. Um, just to begin with that for a minute that um, so I, I was at Columbia until 20, was it 2016 or seven or so? And um, the new dean and I was I had a really interesting position, which was a non tenure track, but full position with like no expiry date. Um, research position where I kind of had this weird situation where I taught for free, but had to teach because it was like a gentleman's agreement. Um, and then, um, but it was, I also was doing research running in the, net, the network architecture lab. And um, the, and Mark Wigley, who'd, who'd founded this whole research project at Columbia um, said that he, you know, it, anything could happen with the new Dean, you know, could, could do away with the, pro, the whole research wing. And of course we thought, you know, this is pretty good, you know, and there were like nine of us or so, like doubt he'll do it, but then he did. So this whole, or, or she did the, so the whole, uh, when the new Dean took over, she got rid of the entire sort of apocalypse to the research thing and there went our jobs. And in a way, you know, and, and but, you know, I also do some other things and um, including invest, investment. Um, and uh, I mean, if we do live in capitalism, I'm not going to, not going to pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, and so, um, the result was that between that that um that meant I you know I was looking at a bunch of deanships and so forth and just said no you know I'm, I'm going to actually bail on this and I'm very been actually quite glad that I have because I've been able to do the things I wanted um, I taught for a while more in Ireland uh, but between the bureaucratization of that university and um, really mainly the bureaucratization of it. Um, and also the, the thought of just flying there all the time, which I was doing, just finally got wear, wearing. So, um, you know, I've been doing other things uh, from rewilding to um, mounting some art, some uh, art shows to writing in various ways. And, um, you know, just during the last, it's really been during the last year and the developments of the last year that have really struck me that um, I wanted to have a really excuse to like visit this material this material that some of which I've taught before and uh, most of which is very new um, and is something that, you know, even de developing the reading list for this course, how do you develop a reading list for things that are, you know, months old, uh, literally. And yet uh, it also really comes out of the sense of mine, hey, feel free to uh, call me out as being wrong because uh, that would be fine, but uh, kind of really exciting. Um, in uh, But it comes out of this feeling of mine that uh, the last three years, and especially the last year, uh, have been incredibly radical, and our time is moving at uh, a much, much faster pace than uh, any time in my 55 years. Uh, so that said, that's what led to this course. Um, the, the project itself uh, is really based maybe on a concept of apophenia or pattern recognition, making connections that may or may not be there. This is paranoia, uh, of mine, um, the mad historians, uh, ideas, or are they actually, uh, or are there actually things like this here? Um, uh, and, uh, we will, this is what, um, this is what the course is about and what I'm trying to seek. It's very much about, uh, what you have to say as well. Um, much, much more, I'm much more interested in what you have to say than what I have to say. Uh, so hopefully there'll be a lot of that going on. Uh, so I'm going to start with a very brief description of the course, the four afternoons, the assignment, uh, and then, you know, uh, I can, we can take some questions at that point, uh, if you have any, uh, and then we can, then I can actually do a short presentation, short, and we'll, we'll see how short it is, um, short or long presentation on uh, the, the first, that is actually comprises the first topic. Um, which and that revolt that you know we only have four sessions together. It's extremely short, um, which is also kind of really interesting. So uh, how can we do a lot in this period of time? Uh, so that's going to be the project for today. We talked a bit. There are there are a few of you, and there will be there are actually twenty three participants right now in chat. And if we all introduced each other, 
today, um, that would pose a problem for the people who will be watching this uh, on YouTube live, uh, be kind of a big chunk of time. So we're gonna, so the, the project was to do that at the beginning of the next course. Um, also, some more people may come in, maybe some of you will flee in horror. Uh, so that would be, um, I think that would be, that was suggested to me. And I think that that's not a bad idea. So if, unless there's um, a lot of pushback on that, I think we should do that. Okay, uh, other thoughts are, it looks like it might be, raining hopefully there won't be any big issues a lot Actually, I was taking a course a couple of years ago and it ended when a giant tree fell in my yard and knocked out the internet so hopefully that won't happen today that was actually the last time I had a zoom course in some sense uh, so there's that um and also potentially landscapers will make a lot of noise but in that case I'll put on headphones so that should all help uh anything right away you want to cover uh or are we should we just keep going Look at that. I can see my chat now. That's great. All right. So I'm going to start with an introduction here then. So again, today, the class overview, um, we're going to be talking about um, basically doing a, a, um, a kind of a survey from postmodernism and theories of postmodernism um, to um, beginning to outline the theory of network culture that um, a few of us were working on um, to some degree in concert, to some degree in competition about um, 15 years ago. Uh, and um, that's, I'm not going to say very much to introduce this session because you'll be hearing it in like five minutes. So why bother? Uh, the, I, I, the readings, you know, we'll also talk about, um, I think, as much during the session, there's not really any point in talking about them. I imagine for many of you, you haven't done the readings yet, some of you have. Um, the one thing that I, I think is really worth mentioning is uh, Mark Lafia made a film um, called Revolution of the Present, originally called, titled Empires, which I actually think that's a better title. Um, and it was eventually released in 2016. I think it was actually filmed around 2012 or so. Uh, and it uh, it's a really interesting film, I think. Uh, I think it was really well made. Mark did a great job. Um, and he happened to have a cast of, uh, of characters, uh, including myself in, in slightly younger days, uh, that uh, like people like Saskia Sassen, um, uh, Mike, again, Empires, Michael Hart is in it. Uh, it's it's really worth watching. It's it's free on YouTube. Obviously, you know we're not going to watch it here, uh, but um, it's I think it's really um, a worthwhile uh, hour and a half of your time. And it's again, it's, it's well made. I was you know I was like wow, this he really did it a nice job, very professionally done. So um, I encourage you to watch that and, uh, because it really does uh, it in many ways it's kind of shocking how much of that. Um, outdated material is actually still very relevant uh, in, in many ways, although it's also that we're reaching um, certain points where it might not be that relevant soon or things might change a great deal. Um, so I guess that really the idea here today is to outline some different, um, you know, the, di the different approaches towards postmodernism, what was postmodernism, what does it mean to have uh, a historical framework like that? So that'll be that project. Should we have a lot of time at the end? We can always do our intros then and save time for next time. Well, let's see. Uh, session two is uh, network theory, uh, social networks and the perils of influence. And this is also gonna be the last slide for today. Uh, the, the 20 teens were obviously a uh, real turbulent era of global crisis uh, that, you know, on the one hand, the 2000s in retrospect, um, don't seem as to have been as much, although they were with the global financial crisis, uh, with 9-11 starting them off, with the um, the uh, disastrous wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, and, and many, many other things going on. Um, but, during the, but during that time, however, uh, there was still more, of, let's say, of a kind of optimistic view of the world that began to really fade. I mean, a, an optimistic view of technology in the world that began to really fade during the 20 teens. Uh, and they became, um, it became obvious that this new thing of social media um, and the internet as a whole had begun to have a pervasive negative influence in society. Um, this is, we will look at some of these, uh, these questions uh, revolving around that. One of the supplemental readings in of all things, the American conservative, 
which I find very amusing. Uh, it actually isn't a very conservative article at all, uh, but Catherine D, also known as default friend from, um, from Twitter and other places, uh, writes, a, I think, a very interesting little piece on how Tumblr transformed American politics, um, principally on the left, although there are uh, there, there are similar phenomenon on the right. And um, it, what interests me is that uh, she ties politics um, to fandom. Um, and to fandom circles. Uh, and during, so during that, so speaking of fandom, if we think of, of political polarization as fandom, uh, um, the, um, the result is that um, we begin to, and this is all, all quite obvious, begin to amplify extreme views and spread misinformation. Uh, maybe you have actually done it in, in the chat. Maybe you've identified who the dude on the left is. I think he may not have been uh, he may not. He may be like one guy who the FBI still hasn't caught. So maybe you should let the FBI know that it's um, who it is. Uh, in any case, the um, so we have political polarization growing. Uh, we have the rise of populist movements. Obviously, Trump. Um, we also have mimetic warfare, which is something um, that is both new and isn't new. They're actually a stick and supplemental. There are some fascinating documents from the early two thousands uh, from military writers. Uh, about the use of mimetic warfare. Um, and I'm much more interested in that than say the writings of uh, Rene Girard, although we can certainly do that. Um, you know, look at those kind of things too. Uh, but there is a uh, mimetic warfare, which is just beginning to be theorized uh, in the early 2000s, you know, leads to the surge in nationalism, uh, globalization and an anti-immigrant sentiment around the world. Um, also, mental health begins to decline greatly. Um, I mean, there are literal statistics to the decline of mental health during this time, uh, as people also begin to need to maintain curated uh, uh, personas. Um, actually, there's another. There's some. There are some other articles that are really worth worth looking at on those. I'll, I'll toss them in there. I I didn't throw them in um, on how people are um, actually. Um, uh, transforming themselves physically in re uh, in relationship to that is like surgically transforming themselves in relationship to um, pressures from social from um, social networks, um, and then we have um, we will end up with a with kind of with COVID and the global pandemic um, at the end there. Uh, the two the two essays here are the two sort of key things here are both quite old actually, but that's you know so I'm a historian so I like old things. Um, one is Deleuze's Postscript and Control Societies, which will be the one Deleuze piece we will read. Um, still, probably the best summation, uh, or a, that's a really stupid thing to say, I guess, if anything, what is the best, but still one of the best summations of um, culture uh, in the late 20th, early 21st century that there is. Um, if you haven't read it, it's really brief, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and then Kenneth Gurdon, Gergen, who is a psychologist, writes in, it says 2000, but it's actually from 1991. It's a reprint um, on the saturated self. And it's, it's very strange because it's it's an essay where he's talking about fax machines and stuff, but he actually correctly anticipates um, a lot of the issues that people face um, in the 20, 2000s and the contemporary era as well. Uh, and they're all exact, everything he's talking about is massively excess exaggerated, exacerbated, and accelerated. Um, and that's a, a really interesting little piece. Uh, and the other one is this one on um, the, um, yeah, we're, we're still on that slide, right? Uh, and uh, the last one is the uh, on the Boogaloo movement, that supplemental, um, Bell and Cat. Um, again, it, it talks about the Boogaloo movement in terms of uh, the internet. So now we, we shift to session three, uh, which is uh, on, oh, you know what, I'm realizing you guys are actually seeing the webinar chat, so we don't actually need to see it twice, do we, right? I can just stick it there. Sorry about that. Uh, so in session three, uh, you know, for want of a better image, I'm just going to throw you this uh, this image from Ex Machina. We could do something better probably, but it was easy. I had one minute to find it. Um, so in this session, we're going to really shift gears into the contemporary. And this is where, uh, again, it's, you know, this is a really group project, much more than my project. And my hope is we can try to come to an understanding as individuals, um, and if possible, as a group on the significance of uh, these large learning model based artificial intelligences like ChatGPT3 uh, and 4, 
um, AI image generators like Midjourney. Um, there's uh, Microsoft researcher Sebastian uh, Bubek uh, recently wrote a paper saying that this is uh, that uh, GPT-4 shows sparks of artificial general intelligence or AGI as we'll call it. Uh, there's also a video, a YouTube video of his I, um, that's that in his paper in the revised syllabus I put up like a, a, an hour ago. And um, we can we can talk about that. Um, is that is that true? Is that naive? Is that marketing speak? W which of those is that? Um, uh, you know what what can we see? What about AI alignment, misalignment, and non-alignment? I mean, I don't mean this to be just a discussion of you know of AI in AI the kind of AI terms that you might get on like the Hard Fork podcast or the um, the two podcasts I mentioned here. Hard Fork is one. The other is uh, Last Week in AI. They're both really useful. I went for a run this morning just so I could listen to Hard Fork because it comes out Fridays. Uh, the other one comes out usually Sundays now. But um, they're interesting to me in that uh, these, these are interesting questions because I think they do actually matter to, very much to contemporary culture um, as well. Um, since this is, a, let's say, a history of culture, not a history of um, technology, of course, although it's a difference now. Um, so the other questions are, what are the economic consequences? Um, we actually have a very brief little blog post from economist Tyler Cohen. Um, the, let's say the Cal Newport New Yorker piece uh, and, and, uh, is also goes back to, does ChatGPT have any kind of mind? Uh, how does it function? What does it mean to be, when I say that uh, this is the era of, of these desiring machines, um, which, which is a reference to the way large language models operate as well as to Deleuze. Uh, and how might, you know, then the question of Hegel, and I don't actually want to read, I mean, we could read Hegel if you wanted. And I know there, you know, there are probably plenty of courses where we would, um, but we can, I think we can just talk about it with through this um, rather good article by Michael Zimmerman, a philosophy professor. Um, on called the singularity, a crucial phase in divine self-actualization. Um, and I think there are a lot of religious overtones in this that I'd like to uncover. It could be useful for us or not. I don't know. Um, let's let's see about that. Uh, the So that's session three. And to session four would be session four, then let's say jackpot theory uh, from dark accelerationism to angelicism. Um, so that one, it then becomes, uh, again, you know, both of these, both these last two have uh, culture written into them in terms of um, what, what kind of culture might be emerging um, in both, uh, what are the consequences of both for contemporary culture? What do we see in art, uh, in intellectual thought and politics as well? Uh, and in this one, we, we will begin, but the real key to this one, as opposed to the last one, is rather than just introducing these topics as much, uh, we're really, which we really are going to be doing starting now, starting and then in the next session, but I really also want to talk about this under the rubric of utopianism. Uh, Postmodernism, -modern, quite obviously, postmodernism as well, uh, were really filled with discussions of utopianism and, and contemporary culture's relationship to them. And uh, these, however, these, um, the, uh, Anna asks about the podcast links, those are actually in the new syllabus, so you should be able to just see them right there when you download the new syllabus. Um, so, uh, and the, the link, there are actually links there. Cool. Um, so we're the thing is that we're now in the last literally in the last like three or four months, uh, discussions about the singularity um, as utopian or dystopian and as and as eminent have become no longer restricted to speculative thought and people, uh, slightly crazy people like myself and, and my friend Ed Keller, who's here uh, talking about this uh, late at night. But now it's, you know, literally this is something that we're hearing about um, in you know, just constantly and everywhere. Uh, Doomerism, uh, which has which has been around for quite a while, um, but is sort of attaining new levels um, ex and accelerationist arguments, both again, have been around for a while, but are now attaining new levels um, of intensity really, really, really rapidly. Uh, and we can look at both uh, some, uh, some of the earlier top uh, writings about Doomerism and accelerationism. That's the uh, the Dark Mountain Manifesto, 
I'm not super thrilled with Dark Mountain and the idea of sitting around and playing guitars or, or around a campfire and complaining about and crying about the end of the world having already happened, but um, it's still worth looking at them because they were very influential in the last decade. And I think there's a degree where that continues to be influential today, at least on, that's, let's say, a kind of a left doomerism. Um, there is uh, the, ex we will do some excerpts um, from the accelerationist reader, probably some Nick Land and that sort of thing. Uh, and then uh, the other things to look at here, um, Joseph Tainter, I think uh, one of my most, one of the more interesting thinkers I've ever uh, encountered is an archaeologist who writes about the collapse of complex societies. And I think his discussion on complexity is still, is still very apt, because uh, we could still go that way. And that way is kind of maybe outside of both both uh, typical doomerism um, and uh, outside of accelerationism a bit. Uh, we'll look at some uh, sections of the peripheral by uh, William Gibson, where he talks about uh, the jackpot and trying to deduce a jackpot theory from that. Uh, Justin Murphy's article on angelicism talks about um, I mean, a, a uh, art movement that I'm sure uh, some of you are familiar with. Uh, that we could call it an art movement, uh, could call it a doomer cult, could call it all sorts of things. Um, Murphy's article uh, has received some criticism as well. Um, it's still not not too bad. It kind of points in a direction, I don't know, just something to read and something to talk about. Um, and this isn't just necessarily a course, on, uh, sorry, a session on, um, excel on accelerationism and doomerism, but just generally, talking about, reflecting about the contemporary and the future. Uh, the final thing that's actually supplemental is uh, yet is another piece on um, that kind of parallels the one in the previous class on uh, religion and um, and the singularity. And in this case, uh, it's uh, Ronald Cole Turner's piece on, um, on uh, the rapture. And he actually, he actually looks very much when, uh, he's comparing like Ray Kurzweil to, uh, people who are like evangelical, uh, evangelicals who are talking about the rapture. So I think that one's pretty interesting if you if you want to go that route. All right. Um, the next thing I just want to talk about briefly, uh, is the, uh, course assignment. Um, we really have, uh, I think the, the you know, uh, we have two projects for this course. Uh, coming out of a kind of architecture research background, I really like to have students take on research projects. Uh, those can also be, those can be pretty broadly figured uh, as well. So I thought of two tracks that I thought would be interesting for you. Here is a robot curating some kind of cabinet of curiosities or something. So the first one is that it's a curatorial project. So I'd say choose eight to 10 artifacts of contemporary culture, and write 450 words on each. They should, um, the idea is to focus on an aspect, not just randomly, but try and like find a theme for this. Um, it's, you know, you could say, wow, that's like a lot of writing, but you know what, 450 words on each, um, on one object of artifact of contemporary culture is very, very brief. Um, it's basically like a lengthy paragraph, maybe two short paragraphs. So that, so that's, um, and then, you know, kind of having a brief introduction and conclusion that would explain what you're up, what you're up to. Those can really be from any media. Uh, I, I didn't, you know, film, literature, music, uh, social media, visual arts, software. Um, you know, just talk to me about it. You know, like uh, both cases uh, would be good to get a proposal by uh, week three. Um, and these can really be any time from, um, let's say, the late 20th century to the present day, but really should be. Uh, aimed at contemporary culture, not say like, you know, um, I don't know, uh, monuments to 9-11 built in 2002 or something. That'd be kind of really an interesting, I think. Um, although maybe you'd have a reason for doing it. And that could be really good. Uh, the uh, Then you assemble them into some kind of package. It could be a book, you know, a PDF book, physical book, why not? Uh, as long as I can see it, a website, a video. It could be a set of posts on Substack. Um, you know, just again, you know, give me an idea of what you want to do. And um, and there are various kinds of examples, historical examples, cabinets of curiosities that in which an object was supposed to explain the world. You could read, pick up an ostrich egg and explain the world from it. Uh, museum catalogs, uh, Roland Barthes mythologies, Walter Benjamin's arcades. There are many, many examples of this that I think could be useful for you. Um, and then the next one is... Uh, 
the second project, which I think I may have actually numbered one. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I just copied and pasted some words. I was thinking they were both numbered one, but that's why. The next one is um, just uh, is the second project, you know, choose one or the other. Um, it would be to use an AI and try and uh, create some kind of thought provoking and meaningful work. Um, and by that, I mean, like less, uh, you know, making robots and cabinets of curiosities, but, you know, try and use it to its limitations. Uh, can you break it? Can you, um, can you, and if you do what, how can you break it? Can you, can you make that breaking an, an interesting part of it? Um, is it, uh, or is there something else you want to do? Is there some kind of like real project that you want to do with it? So try to, you know, run that by me. Uh, and this one, you know, write an essay, I don't know, 500 words. It's not that much, really. Uh, I've probably been speaking a lot longer than 3,500 words already. Um, and again, it could be broken up into like, since it's, you know, uh, it's a work, I imagine there would be, you know, produce the work. So then, you know, are there examples of, you know, maybe you want to break it up into little pieces. I don't know. It's really up to you. Um, but try and do something. You, you could look, for example, I've done, I don't know, you may hate them. I don't care. Uh, but they're, or you might like them, but they're, um, they're just for me. I did a series of projects on um, AI art and uh, fakery and fraudulence in museums on my website. Uh, museums are full of fakes, right? Um, there's a one uh, guy who works at a company that's an art authenticator in Switzerland. Um, so that if you have like a Picasso or something, you take it to him, and he's like, "Yep, that's authentic," or "Nope, that's fake. You got ripped off." Um, he he estimates that over fifty percent of the art he sees is fake. Um, there are estimates that at least a third to 50% of the art you see in museums is fake. Um, not, and this isn't just like stuff that's been done recently, although there's certainly a big industry in that, but fakery and art has existed since uh, at least the days of the Romans. Um, yeah, there, Ed's just tossed it into the chat so you can click on that. Uh, so my interest was then like, okay, so given that fakery is common to art, fraudulence is incredibly common to art. And um, then what does, what does that mean for, you know, for AIs, which obviously make fakes all the time, right? They're really good at making, making fake things. Uh, and so uh, can you then, you know, then reflect on the processes of fakery in various ways? Um, every, and so I was looking at everything from um, the reconstruction of European cities based on uh, questionable uh, paintings. Like, uh, for example, Warsaw was bombed in World War II and they used, uh, Canaletto's paintings, not the not the Canaletto you know from Venice, but his like nephew or something was also named Canaletto, and uh, just to confuse things, so he made all these paintings in Warsaw, um, and then when the when the city was bombed, they rebuilt it based on those paintings, um, or at least the city center, and uh, I think it's Joseph Brodsky who recounts going back to see his childhood home after having fled in the war, and he like everything's kind of there, but then he rounds the corner and there's a wall, and he realizes that. In fact, this is all fake. So I was kind of I was curious in how um, in how uh, these fake places, you know, and how these paintings themselves could be faked. You know, could you make you know what they're very easy to fake, obviously today. Um, but you know, so imagine like an alternate history for for Vilnius. Uh, other things from um, since everybody loves cats for Halloween, I was making cats for my my. Uh, my friends and family like fake witching cats and then it turned out that that got me down a, a I guess not a rabbit hole but a cat hole of of fakery because there's the whole world of spirit photography um so very soon after the development of photography fakery and photography emerged and just as photography was supposed to mean the end of portraiture uh, as a source of you know as the only way to create a verisimilitude of you know likeness of a person suddenly it becomes possible to you know, take photographs that are seem indexical. Uh, you know, you, there's a light, there's the, the pho photographic plate. One one leads to the other. There's no fakery involved, and then very almost immediately afterwards, people are meet are faking it. You know, they're creating spirits. Like Mary Todd Lincoln is communicating with her dead son and her husband through the medium of spirit photography. This is really nuts that this happened immediately after. So there are a whole bunch of these. Um, so I, I was like, okay, well, you know, everybody loves cats. It's the internet. So. Um, you know, so why not do this thing on, you know, this world of cats in New Jersey where I live? Um, so 
you know, so anyway, but but I did all these things playing between art and history, who knows, completely unsuccessful, and that's great. That's exactly what I want. Uh, so just for me. So that so that's an example, you know, of, but but please don't do that one. Um, you know, but that's an example of like where you can also see like how easily essays can be put together. And hey, you also have Chat GPT now, so it's even easier than ever. Um, so you know, um, uh, but you know, the whole key is to be provocative and intelligent in the framing of your project. Uh, if you're using, you know, chat GPT, you know, um, you know, what reflect on what it's doing, you know, uh, don't just give me it's, it's regurgitations and endless qualifiers. All right. Um, let me ask now if any of you have questions about this, or if I should, um, you know, this would be kind of a good time to ask about the course before we actually go into the, um, the actual talk about homo. Or nothing. All right, reach back here into the great beyond. My dream go away. All right, um, the so let's talk about po about homo postmodernism. So, I mean, the the whole project. So this this course comes out of another course on network culture that I developed um, at Columbia and taught at Penn as well. Um, and uh, mainly to architecture students, but it was always interesting because people don't take architecture classes uh, out if, at graduate school generally, if they aren't in architecture programs. Uh, but I kept getting people from comp lit, PhD students, um, I, um, artists, um, all sorts of interesting people from different different uh, different programs uh, in this in this course. So it did seem to have some appeal outside of architecture. And my own relationship to architecture is is broad. You know, on the one hand, uh, I have a PhD in the history of architecture and urban development. On the other hand, uh, by the time I was actually at Columbia, uh, I was very, very much my charge was to at the Net Lab was to investigate contemporary culture and its um, the impact of the changes that the internet was bringing on space, but also on whatever I really cared about. So, um, so I left architecture behind relatively quickly. Although that said, architecture plays a big role in this moment, in um, in the moment of postmodernism. Uh, you can see on the condition of postmodernity that book cover. Uh, that's actually a image from the um, uh, book Delirious New York by Kohlhaas and Zangelis. Um, the Frederick Jameson's book, Postmodernism, uh, is also very concerned with architecture. Um, so um, that is something that, um, you know, it, it, it played a big role in both. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, when when I was studying, you know, in the early 90s, the, these books were, like, everybody was trying to puzzle them out. Um, the, another book that's not in this list is actually one of my teachers, um, uh, Hal Foster's book, uh, The Anti-Aesthetic, and we just rewatched the movie Slacker, and there, um, there's somebody babbling theory speak in uh, in Slacker, and then uh, Hal's book uh, actually just gets shoved in a backpack, like in this close-up. So there's, it was, was a time when we would, this, these were the things that were dominant. And incredibly enough, I still see these these books on syllabi, I st um, and seemingly under unreflectively. Uh, there's a ton of talk about postmodern thought. The right the right is critiquing postmodern thought, uh, particularly uh, often in kind of just like really base terms, but uh, in terms of as a synonym for relativism. But um, that said, um, we also are talking about something that's 40 years old. Uh, and that's already in the 2000s, that seemed wrong to me. Like, how on earth are we still talking about this is a cultural moment that if we clearly aren't living in. And so I began developing this course in network culture. Um, and then, you know, I figured, well, that's going to last a good um, 10, year, 10 more years. And uh, Bruce Sterling, who, uh, who I know, and who is also, we we're both following each other a lot. And he, uh, he gave a talk, uh, A Temporality for the Creative Artist. I'm looking for the actual video it might be on a computer in my basement. Uh, it's no longer on the internet, the, the video of his talk at Transmediale in 2010. Um, but 
I think it's in my basement. I just need to figure out if this, if I, if this computer still works or if I, because it doesn't have hard drives so I can read on any modern computer. But if I can find it, I'll post it. It's actually a flash. Um, but um, I have to transcode it. But in any case, he, um, he and I both came to the conclusion that network culture was going to last another 10 years. And now it's, look at this, it's 2023. So it's all, we're already three day, three years past our expiry date. And it came to a crashing halt with COVID, I think. But um, but if if we were right that network culture lasted 20 years, then we're now 40 years past postmodernism. That's a really long time. Uh, and it seems somehow wrong that we aren't talking about this here historically, because I am a historian, right? Um, and one thing that's happened is historians have, st have stopped talking about the contemporary by and large. Like this is, uh, there are a bunch of reasons for this, um, but, and I'll go into those in the next, in a minute or two, but um, Jameson himself uh, was in 1981 in the political conscious uh, had a slogan always historicized that he then elaborate elaborated to the, the term to the quote you cannot not periodize uh, in his book a singular modernity of 2002 uh, and yet we don't like to periodize we aren't talking about these as eras and there's a lot of things wrong with them we can get into this in a minute uh, but. Um, but we aren't doing it. And I think that in itself is interesting. Uh, a little bit about my own background. I, you know, I come out of thinkers like Harvey and, Mar and Jameson and the kind of a Marxist tradition. I don't really hold myself within that that much anymore. I feel like um, I haven't read much in recent Marxist writing that really compels me anymore. Uh, my own politics are um, a lot more question I really unclear to anybody, especially me now. Um, but uh, but there's something something within that in my own background um, that st I still find compelling and that there is an economic explanation for things. Although that said, I think one of the most important things for me, just a couple of odd things about this course or just about my own and my own thinking. One is that I think that both the left and the right, and particularly like the new genre of like right wing theorists, like the kind of um, alt theorists, the, you know, the kind of the outsider theory folks uh, who live on the internet now, particularly, uh, everybody kind of still talks about capitalism as if it's a god, uh, as if it's a kind of, uh, you know, some kind of thing with its own volition. And I really, you know, increasingly wonder that. Um, and that's something maybe we can get into a bit in the third class. Uh, but, you know, I really wonder if that if that's something we should be believing in, or if that's just a religious um, any appropriation of um, religious discourse that might be really mistaken. But let's talk for a minute about why we, you know, postmodernism was like kind of the last great era. It was the last time we talked about things. But it goes even further that, than that. Um, you know, we're now beginning for the first time in the last like five years, we've begun talking about the 20 teens and the 2020s, but it was really glaring during the 2000s that there wasn't even a name for the decade. Was it, we still don't really have it, which is really strange. But the strange thing about that decade, um, was it the aughts, the, um, the O's, the O's, the 2000s? Um, nobody really had a good name for it. And that's kind of a very, uh, very strange thing. Um, it might have to do with what Baudrillard talks about, um, which which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but let's talk about this for a minute about the idea of of, uh, of what I'm after here, which is trying to trying to come up with broader ideas about contemporary culture. Which is like let's say it this way: this is very controversial in the academy, in the traditional academy, that you could actually speak in generalities, uh, particularly in history, where for all the for much of like modern his modern history, that is modern historiography, not modern, the histori historiography during the modern period, like let's say since nineteen since uh, eighteen hundred, um, there has been a real interest in trying to understand the contemporary, uh, trying to map it historically using historical explanations, and maybe that's backwards. And if that's backwards, that's fine. Let's have a anachronistic seminar here, like with a all the trappings in the 19th century. But um, but at the same time, it's curious we aren't historicizing that way anymore. And, or maybe a lot of people aren't in the academy at least. And the critiques typically have been that his, 
that talking about things like postmodernism or modernism, or as I was told, network culture, are one that it overgeneralizes, that uh, total, a totalizing history, a history that tries to embrace everything, um, tends to general to do away with any kind of intricacies and nuances of historical events, um, leading to oversimplification and inaccuracies. Um, guilty as charged, for sure, um, for sure. But that's so is like any process of abstraction or thought about categories in general. Uh, ignores diversity, for sure, imposing a single narrative. Uh, it can, overlooks difference, um, such as experiences of marginalized groups, for sure. But how are you to understand the experiences of marginalized groups without trying to understand their relation, any kind of broader holes? Um, including what might be oppressing marginalized groups and the role of marginalized groups within societies, because they certainly are not at all where they were 50 or 20 or 10 years ago. Um, does it reinforce power structures? Uh, that was another critique that was given at the time, that they privilege dominant cultural or social perspectives. If you let them, sure. If, you, if that's, you know, if you're reading like Thomas Friedman or something like that. Um, and, you know, when I was interested in network culture, I had like one, one colleague of mine who was kind of like, he was a Marxist. He hasn't written very much since. And I'm not terribly surprised, but he was he was saying, well, there's nothing new here. Like there's nothing has changed since the 80s. It's like, okay, nothing's changed since the 80s, except that, you know, the internet didn't exist in the 80s. About 2 million people had some kind of mobile phones in the 80s, generally people working for corporations or maybe the extreme global elite or people with limos. Now, like something like 6.8 billion people have have phones, more people have phones than have mobile phones that have toilets. Um, and, you know, yeah, right. There's nothing to see here. Right. I'm not so sure about that. Um, so, but in, in, in defense of totalization, in defense of periodization, I think that it's important because allowing to make broad and stupid judgments about culture allow us to understand where things are. They allow us to navigate. They allow us to navigate the, navigate time just as we navigate space. Um, categorizing history into periods allow us to, allows us to identify patterns, trends, and commonalities, and also uh, differences and things that malfunction within periods, things that are out of time, uh, and allow us to do comparative analysis. And I think that's really important, um, really important for me as a historian, um, you know, and so that that's stuff that matters to me as historical explanations. Um, but we could also see that this topic of a historicity or this attack, uh, this desire, this belief that time is not that we shouldn't be talking about periods. That for some reason postmodernism was the last period we should talk about. Which is also like we could be really generationist about this, but being a Gen Xer, that's like a really boomer thing to say. You know, like our our era is the last era that matters. I you know, just kind of heard that kind of thing a lot, uh, even if from if from people to saying that about music to whatever. Um, so, you know, boomer culture, e.g. postmodernism, is the last era that mattered. Great. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate that. Uh, but you also could see it as being related to broader forces. To, uh, and but that's where Baud the Baudrillard comes in. Um, throughout the 90s, Baudrillard is really just obsessed with uh, the millennium. He feels that... Um, the so throughout the 90s, there are these kind of constant clocks, you know, you'd see these stupid clocks in places counting down towards the millennium. Uh, all these millennium celebrations were happening. The Millennium Dome was built. Um, you know, like a friend of mine built, did, uh, did a millennium, won a competition in Dublin to uh, build a millennium clock and then put it in the River Liffey underwater so you could see it, you know, in typical fashion, you know, the the uh, you couldn't see it because the, the river is kind of murky. So it became known as the time and the slime, you know, this, this whole thing, Y2K, the whole thing was the, the doomerous belief that um, not really doomerous belief, but the kind of a survivalist belief that society would stop functioning due to the Y2K bug because um, so much uh, software had been written into the into into the 1990s in which dates were uh, stored in two digits. So it was thought that planes were going to fall from the sky. Uh, and then when 2000 rolled around, like I remember sitting in my apartment, seeing the Hollywood in LA, looking out like seven miles away at the Hollywood sign, it changed color. That was it. It's like, 
Okay, lame. Uh, but there's this idea, but for Baudrillard, um, that countdown and that kind of that nothingness at the end of it, at most a hangover, um, was, after a good party, uh, was not a countdown to the millennium, but it was rather a countdown to the end of the end, a countdown to the end of the end of history. So you aren't even talking about the end of history. You're talking about the end of the end of history, because the end of history was actually a big topic back then. Uh, this is a bit of a reflection of um, and kind of uh, engagement with of his with uh, the writings of Francis Fukuyama, uh, who in the end of history wrote about how liberal democracy was uh, at, with the fall of the Soviet Union uh, lib and the um, capitalization of China. Liberal democracy had become a um, liberal democracy had become uh, the dominant. Uh, ideology in the world and was the world was just heading towards liberal democracy. Uh, he's he's since kind of there's if you read the book and if you listen to him, especially in his interview since he's saying like this is still a process, things are still going to happen. But at the same time, there's unquestionably this idea of um, that there was not going to be any kind of earth shaking change, although it's kind of wrong. Um, but um, but in Baudrillard's writing, there were there were like basically like four real um, four real categories or um, themes about um, that he points to. One is a kind of loss of linear progress. Uh, he challenges the idea of linear historical progress. He says that uh, the end of history is a uh, is or the end of the end of history is is because of the kind of a reversibility of events, a self-replicating loop of history in which we're stuck, endlessly repeating similar scenarios, let's say bank crises, uh, even the pandemic seems to be a, re a re repetition. Um, this kind of endless loop of history undermining our sense of progress. Um, there's also kind of compression of time, uh, which is huge and kind of comes back in David Harvey, especially the kind of the compression of, of time due to the acceleration of technology. That is that um, we, everything, I mean, acceleration of time is kind of obvious. That is that we're, but also the, the compression of space, that we're compressing space right now and that we're all here. And I think the closest of you, maybe there's somebody in New York City that would be like 15 miles from me. Uh, so, you know, we live in this rad radically compressed uh, place spatially. Uh, our own sense of temporality is completely distorted in new ways. Uh, so that that change, that leads to a kind of end of history. Uh, the I think the real key to Baudrillard is really the proliferation of signs. Uh, that there is like a massive overabundance of signs, a massive overabundance of information, uh, resulting in a loss of meaning. We can't ground ourselves in any way. Uh, and there's a kind of the result is a collapse of true and false or reality and illusion. And he's really writing all of this before 2000. And I think that that's all of this is even more true today. I mean, like how in the world, you know, um, you know, can we the, the huge amount of of uh, of information out there, our ability to like distinguish between the true and the false. It's all completely gone. Finally, an implosion of events. Um, this kind of the this again very rapid acceleration of uh, of events leading to a sense of implosion, again leading to an illusion of the end. Um, and so the Baudrillard reading we can go you can go into that we can talk about it if you want more depth. Um, but um, I think that's kind of the general gist of that idea. And by the way, if you have any comments or questions, just interrupt me at any point. Just raise your hand. I should be able to see it. So let's start with these kind of two theoretical frameworks um, for this, uh, that for postmodernism, I think these are the two most compelling to me, is the Leotards, which really doesn't apply at all. He's a Leotard is really, in fact, writing his thing, his essay for the French government on a, about for about science. So Leotard doesn't apply. There are a few others, really the two dominant ones uh, for me, um, especially given their Marxist origins, which I think were just were interesting because they were based on, um, on economics, even if again a little bit uh, too deistic with their uh, attitudes towards capital, uh, with a, there's David Harvey and there's uh, uh, Frederick Jameson, and David Harvey's is really the more coherent of the two, uh, and he has his idea of um, really has to do with trying to look at 
economy uh, and trying to figure out how, I mean, it's like a central problem for Marx. Uh, Marxism has always been, how does culture and ideology uh, figure into uh, a broader economic history? And so for Harvey, uh, he, he turns towards uh, sort of theories, both, both Harvey and Jameson both turn towards theories that come out of the French regulation school. Uh, in Harvey's case, it's uh, Elietta's theory of capitalist regulation. Uh, and that's, let's say, okay, um, that has to do with the kind of the economic structure of a society. Um, and just get this for a second. Yeah, we're okay. Uh, and so we have uh, a regime of accumulation, which is really, you know, basically has to do with kind of the mode of production um, and how it functions. Uh, and that uh, that is principally let's say a kind of question of the uh, the organization of uh, production distribution uh, and uh, on also on um, really the economic structure of uh, of production uh, as well. So I think it's easier to just look at this. He, he categorizes uh, modernism into two cat into two or he, he looks at modernism as being primarily Fordist postmodernism is primarily post-Fordism. And what does that mean? Fordism refers to, to the, uh, the mode of production that has to do with the assembly line, with the factory developed quite literally by Henry Ford. Um, and um, the, uh, the idea of mass production in, in a factory. Uh, the worker has one task and one task only. The, um, the result is that um, this, this results in this huge amount of, uh, of production it, uh, that in the early part of the 20th century, it's a kind of very industrially oriented economy, production, production of physical goods, uh, as opposed to, and has, uh, has a kind of very vertically integrated system. Uh, Ford owned its own uh, its own forests, its own coal mines, its own railroads. Um, it, it had its own dealerships, so everything was Ford. Uh, the, we will get into what the workers did as well in a minute, because that's that's very key. But then there's also the regime the regime of accumulation. The regime, sorry, there, there's also then there's also post Fordism. Post Fordism, which initially is called Fiodism, is based on emerges in the 1960s and is really based on um, the idea that the, the assembly line was beginning to come apart uh, as a kind of a model for production. Um, there began to be economic crises related to uh, the kind of the, the increase, the rigidity and the perceived rigidity of the assembly line. That is that assembly lines, um, in the assembly line, uh, everything was optimized towards the assembly line being in continual motion. If something happened to, uh, they would try to fix it and then the thing would go on its way. This would lead to, to situations like parking lots outside of factories full of cars that had their engines mounted wrong. It's quite literally happened uh, at General Motors. Um, this would lead to, to extensive work after the fact. Unlike say Toyota's assembly line where workers were, so in, under Fordism workers were discouraged from, act, from ever shutting down the assembly line except unless somebody's arm was getting chopped off and probably not even then. But under Toyotaism, workers were engaged and uh, expected uh, and of Toyota uh, in particular, which was kind of a much more um, radical post-war company. Um, workers were expected to shut down the assembly line so the assembly line could be uh, worked on, could be more, could be optimized. Um, optimization of uh, the economic resources of a corporation becomes especially important post-Fordism. Uh, there's a big belief in uh, corporate offshoring. This is why uh, the woman working on the Apple computers is in Singapore. Uh, that uh, that means that Apple is now contracting out. So we're looking at the end of the vertical, the integrated corporation. We're talking about a much more global enterprise. Uh, we're, we're looking at a world where uh, Toyota, for example, is noted for having extensive networks of parts suppliers uh, that, uh, again, Ford was basically, it was all owned by Ford. Ford made everything. Uh, Toyota had a huge network of parts suppliers it could draw on. If it didn't like this part, it could always draw on another one. Uh, and the key began to be a kind of information marshalling. 
How do you make sure that all this material is uh, entering into the factory at the right time? How do you deal with this process of logistics? Uh, and also, uh, as uh, post fordism develops, that begins to become more and more important. So services take over from industrial production. Even if she's still working on, on a machine, she's testing Apple computers, uh, services become, uh, become more important. So that by uh, the so Fordism affected not only capitalist states, but it was also uh, key to both not, not for, Nazism could be seen as Fordist. And um, uh, also Stalin was very enamored with Fordism and Stalinism was uh, became um uh, was it what could be seen could be seen as a Fordist enterprise? Uh, Stalin himself uh, was very glad to uh, have Henry Ford come and build uh, build plants for him. And uh, so, by the, the time, it, if you uh, know the moment when Nikita Khrushchev bangs his shoe at the United Nations and screams, "We will bury you!" to the United States, he specifically uh, one of the things he's referring to is uh, he's uh, he had, they have a plan to produce more iron than the United States will by the 1980s. Uh, and this would be this was seen as a kind of immense threat to American uh, uh, industrial hegemony. And they won. Yeah, they actually produced more iron than the United States did by the 1980s. But that didn't matter. It was done. Um, this is one thing we should throw into the reading, just at least as a supplemental, uh, is Manuel Castell's The Rise of the Network Society. Uh, Manuel, um, this is something that, that he writes about as well, about. Uh, in some depth, uh, particularly the crisis in the Soviet Union, if you're interested in it, I have that, I can share it with you. In any case, the um, that the point is that the reason the Soviets were able to, or the problem with, ha with having all, it was great that the Soviets had, were making more iron than the US was, or more steel than the US was, but it required three people to Xerox a to make a photocopy because you had to have a KGB agent and two other people involved so that there would nothing bad would happen. Uh, computer by this point, personal computers were being were uh, becoming very popular, and yet computation in the Soviet Union was extremely hard to come by and uh, very much in the province of the government. So in that sense, uh, industry moves over towards services themselves, right? Um, another example would be McDonald's, which seems like it might be really Fordist because it's this rigid, uh, mass-produced uh, uh, product. And yet, uh, McDonald's is all as as Castells and Harvey both point out. And McDonald's is actually a services corporation. They're engaged in um, in data management. That's their principal goal: is data management, is uh, figuring out how not to run out of Big Macs, which I think they began to finally do during COVID. But before that, you know, never in history did McDonald's ever run out of Big Macs. So. Um, in any case, that's that's a little bit on this idea of the regime of accumulation. Um, but that's also so. Uh, let, but the other a big part of it is the mode of social and cultural production. And that's where Harvey is dealing with these things that Marxism couldn't really didn't have a great way of talking about until the regulation school. And the, the mode of, of social and political regulation refers to various kinds of um, social frameworks that accompany these um, uh, these historical periods, like, for example, uh, labor relations, the relations of unions um, to industry. Uh, under Fordism, unions and industry had a, a to, certainly had an antagonistic relationship. At the same time, unions provided a kind of predictability for corporations. Uh, there was, workers were not going to leave Ford Mode. After an one thing that happened at Ford, when they first set up the assembly line, workers left like crazy. They, the amount of turnover for the first couple of years was phenomenal. It was something like 70%. Uh, and that was I think, within a few months. Uh, it was a miserable job. You weren't allowed to talk. You were just forced to like, you know, put a bolt on a wheel all day long or something horrific like that. Uh, but after a while, what Ford did was he introduced the 40-hour work week. He introduced um, uh, various kinds of benefits to the workers. Um, uh, and uh, Along with that, and, and that let's say that's a kind of a positive thing. The worker retention came, became much, much higher. At the same time, he also introduced these various kinds of. Um, he became concerned that workers, for that money, be um, be able to um, perform to the standards he wanted. So, uh, so certain things happened. Like, for example, there were a lot of immigrants, uh, particularly from Eastern and Southern Europe and, uh, working for Ford. So he had, uh, they had to take, uh, English classes and become American citizens. Uh, they also, 
were asked to, there also were, had uh, social workers visit them in their homes to make sure that their homes were tidy, that the kids were going to school, that they weren't, uh, that they were saving their money because savings under Fordism is a very important, it's a savings oriented society, not a credit oriented society. And uh, so for Ford, the idea that workers would uh, workers would have to be monitored by social workers. So you had an army of social workers going out talking to these people. Um, and um, that, so that's a big part of it, labor relations, but also social norms. So un, uh, under Ford, uh, we'll see this in a second, um, that social norms under Fordism were very much about a kind of um, rational consumption. Uh, consumption for desire was discouraged. Consumption for rational, productive use uh, was encouraged. For example, uh, I didn't could have in previous classes I would have might have shown today. I didn't uh, an, an ad for, an early ad for a car. Early ads for cars typically weren't about desire. They were about the practicality of the cars. Like there was one ad about why this woman is why this young woman is smarter than a hundred men, and the reason was because she bought a Ford car that she used not for fun, but she used it for business. Uh, and uh, this was actually very much the way the Model T was sold. It was sold to farmers as a way. Uh, there was a Model T pickup version as a way of being able to bring their uh, produce to um, to markets on Sundays, which, by the way, means you aren't going to church if you're bringing your produce to the to the train to the market to be put on a train to be distributed on Monday. But that's like, that's Fordism, like rational consumption, right? Um, other things, uh, there are also uh, various state policies involved in regulating, uh, regulating the e economy. Uh, starting in the Great Depression, Keynesian economics is, is very much a part of Fordism. The idea that an, eco that an economic system could be regulated uh, and that that for Harvey it becomes the kind of the moment when Fordism is in full bloom is with Keynesianism, when the economy can now be fully regulated, um, at least for a time, uh, and uh, so that during during downturns the economy can uh, there can be borrowing can be made, infrastructural investment can happen, uh, the economy can get going again, and during um, during upswings taxation can pay that back, right? Uh, and then uh, prevent un prevent a kind of a boom and bust cycle and kind of smooth out the curves. Um, Keynesian economics was uh, was huge to, from like the 30s into the uh, into the 19 early 70s, really, the, the OPEC energy crisis. Um, what it proved for political reasons not to be feasible anymore because nobody ever wanted to pay the taxes. And, you know, that was the end of that. Um, and uh, so, but that that was say this a little bit on the mode of social and uh, and political regulation for under Fordism. Under post-Fordism, though, suddenly and here's Don Draper met uh, the from Mad Men already, kind of an old show, but whatever. Um uh, uh here he has meditate the ad and an ad man, a kind of a guy who's on the at his, his, the whole trajectory of Mad Men is a transition from Fordism to post-Fordism and culture. And uh, Matt and Mad Men Don Draper, um, who is, you know, this consummate uh, advertising professional, he's moving on into a world of uh, here he is at Big Sur, you know, meditating. And while he's meditating, he's also dreaming up a slogan for uh, for the next uh, generation of Coca-Cola ads. Um, so at this point, uh, under post-Fordism, then, uh, we have a world of flexible production. No longer under Fordism, workers were expected to stay in one place um, for all their lives. Uh, you were like, you know, you were a, a Ford man, you were a General Motors man, and you know, typically also these were also male-oriented business, male-oriented jobs, and gendering this on purpose. Uh, under post-Fordism, though, uh, you know, women are encouraged to seek out uh, to seek out business to seek out jobs. Um, people are encouraged to have more. Uh, Flexible forms of product to flexible forms of labor. People are encouraged to find new jobs. Like you know, your typical university professors, your typical university professor would get tenure track and stay in one one place. Maybe they'd move somewhere else, but they'd stay in one place their entire lives and you know get a gold watch at the end. You know, big faculty festschrift at the end, kind of thing or something. And now you know by the by the by the 1980s, uh, faculty were really beginning to move around. And you know by the 90s, kind of uh, for there's the thought of getting tenure track is is laughable became laughable for for many of us. Uh, the only key was to like move around, try and desperately survive however you could, because post Fordism also involved much more precarity for uh, for the individuals involved. It wasn't uh, for the for the workers. Um, similarly, 
under post-Fordism, the Keynesian model runs runs aground. Instead, we begin to have uh, the monetarist model, in which uh, familiar to us from contemporary, even from contemporary economic conditions, of uh, using uh, interest rates to control um, to control boom and bust cycles, uh, it begins to be used. That really develops only in the 1980s under uh, under um, Reagan, uh, and uh, the. So again, labor relations, instead of collective bargaining, instead of unions, you have a kind of much more aggressive uh, labor situation, much more atomized. Uh, individuals are now, um, it's up to individuals to achieve more, but it's also, uh, but it also is a much higher precarity. Um, there is a, uh, in terms of rational consumption and rational production, that is also um, completely out the window. Um, so uh, just rational consumption is out the window. Instead, we have uh, desire and uh, it becomes uh, becomes important. Like, let's look at these two ads. I think these say everything right here. Um, so in these two ads, uh, we have these guy, this guy here on the left. He's actually an Olympic hurdler. Uh, and, for, and he's saying for digestions, his name is Glenn Harden. He's the world record holder in the 1936 Olympics. Uh, and he's an Olympic hurdles winner. And he's saying like, yeah, for digest for digestion's sake, smoke camels. That's what I do, and my digestion goes along okay. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a uh, discussion about the doctors believe uh, uh, believe that camels are good for you. A feeling of well-being comes after a good meal and plenty of camels. Uh, cigarettes uh, were were seen as aiding digestion. Uh, you could be a better worker if you were uh, smoke cigarettes. So it's a bizarre ad, right? You know, I mean, cigarettes aren't even being seen as being something to desire. It's something that medically is, um, is good for you. And that in turn is actually a reaction that is not like, because people didn't know better and advertisement was bad. If you, if you read Jackson Lear's amazing book, Fables of Abundance, which talks about the origin of advertising and religious imagery in the 19th century. And, um, he, he talks very much about how um, the, the 19th century, how the early, the late 19th and early 20th century were a reaction against uh, more uh, esoteric and let's say uh, spiritually uh, forms of, of or advertisement that drew on spiritual and esoteric, uh, more esoteric traditions. In fact, he kind of, he sees the origins of American advertising as being in uh, patent medicines uh, and, you know, like things like even Coca-Cola, things that were sold off the back of wagons in um, in uh, small towns. And, the, and everybody would gather around to hear the, the, uh, the salesman's pitch. Uh, for you know a little drink full of uh, full of some heroin and and soda and soda water uh, or cocaine and soda water and uh, they would buy it based on you know like how convincing he was and this in turn Lears points out uh, comes out of uh, revivalists uh, that is religious revivalists uh, priests going around in wagons uh, you know uh, taming snakes speaking in tongues raising uh, maybe not raising the dead but you know like healing the healing the injured uh, in various ways and again you know everybody knows Lear says these aren't cultural dupes these are people who know that um, that this is fake but they just like a good show and so that um, that kind of that however there's a backlash against that. Um, as being kind of an appeal to baser instincts. And so by the late 19th century, as advertising develops as a profession, suddenly there's a big backlash against it and, and everybody goes towards like, wear a nice, wear a beautiful bonnet for Easter Sunday. You will look your best, something like that. Uh, or smoke camels for digestion's sake. Uh, by the 1980s though, the world, uh, the uh, advertising has changed a great deal. Uh, in this case, this is uh, an ad for Depp uh, hair cream, uh, and it's depraved. You know, she's depraved. Uh, it's a styling. It says it's a styling product that's just as changeable as you are. It's positively sinful yet depraved. It's a completely different model of um, a different social model being delivered by advertising itself, right? Um, and uh, that, that I think speaks a lot towards um, towards what we mean. Uh, what, what Harvey's talking about. Uh, and along with that, then, if we have this regime of accumulation, is see the slide again, with, instead of um, uh, on the right, we've replaced this now with a form of cultural production. So in other words, for Harvey, um, and it, what's happening is that there is this 
cultural production, which is kind of taking out of Raymond, uh, that, that term is taken out of Raymond Williams, uh, referring to the way cultural products are created, distributed, and consumed, um, referring to the organization of creative industries such as art, literature, music, and film. Um, and these two are impacted by the regime of accumulation of the day. Uh, so the Bauhaus, you know, this building that uh, that was the first real school of um, uh, of uh, modern uh, modern um, art and architecture uh, in the West, at least the Kudemus in the in the East, but let's say in Germany, uh, this noted place. You know, that's not just an innocent aerial. That's an aerial because. Uh, the Bauhaus is being, that's a photograph from a plane. The Bauhaus is located next to the Junkers aircraft factory. Uh, the Bauhaus is seen, that labor, that's a laboratory building here. That's seen as being uh, a place of production, a place where mass production will take, pl will take place. The school is seen as a place of, uh, yeah, there's some dadists that roll through there. But on the whole, all of that's experimentation. It's literally seen as a scientific experimentation. The uh, the Bauhaus masters dress in uh, in lab coats, and um, they are. Uh, I mean, I just put it in the side because uh, he he gets drummed out rather early. Uh, and even if they, they wind up being most of the Bauhaus uh, people, uh, Bauhausler are. Oops. Okay, I'm now moving on my own. I'm not going to stop that. Uh, the Bauhausler. The Bauhaus teachers, the Bauhaus students, are see themselves as being um, in a. They see themselves. Most of them see themselves, or a lot of them see themselves as communists. They too appeal to the methods of Fordism, and they see that as a step towards towards uh, towards communism. But again, this is being this building is meant to be seen from the air as well, because it's meant to be seen from an aircraft, uh, from aircraft taking off because there's Dessau is also home to an aircraft corporation. Um, and Bauhaus is always trying to make deals with industry um, throughout its history uh, to keep it afloat. Um, and so again, there's a, that's very, very closely tied together uh, as a model. But, but you could look at this in any way. You could think of you know, the Park Avenue skyscraper and that in fact, Don Draper would have been in when started in, you know, in which you are, you are the, the man in the gray flannel suit, uh, uh, and uh, trying to achieve, you know, tr trying to climb that corporate ladder. Uh, and, you know, the, the building itself in, is a location for that. And architecture is a very big part of this, right? Uh, it's also a time, it's also a key time in which advertising, it's again, through, thinking through the Bauhaus, Maholinage, uh, Maholinage leaves Germany, goes and creates uh, the Institute for Design in Chicago, uh, and really begins to revolutionize commercial art as a um, as a field of pseudoscientific study, uh, he has a whole theory called the uh, vision in motion that George Kepesh uh, later on works with in uh, in the, the language of vision is the Kepesh book, fascinating book in which they they argue that uh, thinking in space and time, thinking laying out a, a image in space and time like an ad is a way of training the sensorium to think in four dimensionally in space and time. So like you imagine an ad in which, or an image that has a dynamism in it. So you start here and then you, you, your eye moves around and doing that is supposed to train your sensorium, which will allow you to have a better mind for post-war logistics, which is or even in, just written during the war. Uh, so logistics during the war, how you would move material during space and time. So you would have these ads around, this is thought that you could have ads around like the city and they would be training soldiers to and, and, and technocrats to actually think in ways that would be efficient for World War II and also for industries really strange uh, and kind of very esoteric as well. Um, but it's there, I did a dissertation part on that. So I kind of know a bit about it. But uh, but then under postmodernism, that postmodernism comes very much out of that world, but, or let's say in that milieu is that it's coming out of a world in which commercial art was already like, people like Barbara Kruger are born, who's in the bottom right, are born into the world of commercial art. They, you know, they already, their world is one where, uh, where the ads have already, are already all infected by modernism. They already are modern. Um, the ads of the 60s and, the, and especially of the 70s and onwards, 
uh, infected by commercial art itself, by by modernism. There's and this this leads to all these art theorists talking about how um, how there's no more that kind of like Peter Berger in the theory of the avant garde writes about how there's no more distance between capital and and, and the avant garde at that point because they're now they're now so intimately linked. Um, you certainly think of the Apple computer as well. That it's not just, it's particularly the Macintosh, that it's not, not just a machine. It's not, the Macintosh is not a calculator at all. It's a machine designed to be creative. You know, Steve Jobs' great insight is uh, is typefaces, right? You know, the desktop publishing. Um, and, you know, here's Kruger, who's playing with advertising and this kind of, you know, loop of playing with advertising to produce art that in turn, you know, and I like Barbara a lot, you know, she's a really smart, interesting person who really believes what she does, but, you know, her work also, you know, the art world is a market as well, very much a market by the, by the sixties and certainly by the eighties when she's working. So here, here she's operating with commercial art principles, interrogating them for sure. But at the same time, or if she's part of that market and doing that just kind of cranks the spiral ever deeper. Like there's no, there's no, this is a big part for Jameson is that there's under postmodernism, there's no longer an outside to capital, right? There's no longer an outside of that regime. Uh, and hopefully it made some sense in terms of like what Harvey's after about the difference between say, the mode of social and political regulation, which may be more in terms of, again, a kind of organizational um, and uh, in terms of like the still kind of sociological and the, um, let's say the art world of um, the form of cultural production uh, that uh, let's say now that's more the art world, that's the world of culture. Uh, you know, we could look at it, we could look at plenty of uh, other examples, but you could also just, you know, look at them on your own. We could take a look all day doing those. Um, Another one more example of this uh, that we can also overlay next time um, when we can overlay Deleuze's disciplinary societies versus society's control. For one, these 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 um, these regimes have roots further back in time. Deleuze pushes it back to push, pushes back Fordism in terms of a disciplinary society. Everybody knows their place. Everybody's like a cog in the machine. Back to the 19th century, and I think he's right about that too. I think that Fordism, you know, these. History is not absolute. You don't go like 1910 happened and Fordism happened. No, not at all. It has roots in other things. Um, and so just as the contemporary has roots in the past as well, um, but uh, that, that you can never pull out of, you know, everything is a continuum. It's like you start pulling and there's the thread that goes back to the, to, um, to, to the dinosaurs. But in terms of uh, Deleuze, he's also, you know, pointing to Michel Foucault's writing in Discipline and Punish and the idea of a sort of, a society based on organization that say ultimately does have its full flowering under Fordism. So here are children at uh, at a high school, mandatory universal education, everyone forced to do the same thing, um, and everybody behaving in concert, right? Um, a place where everybody knows where they are. You could replace this with a factory floor. You could replace this with an office uh, full of secretaries in the late 19th century, all doing the same thing, right? And then you could compare that world to the world of, sorry about that, to the world of Google. This is already 2013, the Google office, a very post, you know, the post Fordist even um, office uh, still existing, um, still part of, you know, e even under network culture, or whatever, but a, an office that is now, you know, based on principles really beginning to, to be developed in the late 1960s by, you um, uh, in office design, uh, the idea that an office should be fun to go into, and rather than an office being a place in which you just work, it becomes a place of self-realization, uh, a place literally in which you, because if you can't, if you no longer know where you fit, right, if you no longer know that you fit in this, you're the work in the mailroom, then you move up to being a junior assistant um, to the ad write, co copywriter, and then you move up until you become the copywriter, and then you move up until you become an advertise a manager, an advertising executive, and you keep going. At some point, you might drop out. Um, for women, it's very easy because under Fordism, women go like five years, have babies, and out they go, right? But um, because it's, you know, very, very, um, very masculinist uh, society, misogynist society. But for but today, you know, it's like a place of, of self or 
at least it was under, let's say, in the high in the high high times of all this, uh, it's a time of uh, self realization in the office. So the office becomes a place, it, ideally not of oppression, but of fun, you know, and a play uh, a place in which um, you can go and there's a there's you know a giant machine giving you blueberries and all the sodas you want, and there are foosball tables and you can get massages. Um, but obviously that has a real dark side too, right? I think of a friend who was a Razorfish. Uh, she was a student. This is like in the 90s. Uh, and she was a student at Razorfish, which was a kind of cons um, early internet consulting agency that um, had its heyday before the uh, before the dot-com bust. And um, it had a bust and it had layoffs. And that's why she was my student. <laughs> now, so she was... Um, she said how like, you know, they would have to do things like go play paintball from time to time. And everybody had to go in little yellow school buses and play paintball. And so one day they went out, they were told, hey, everybody, we're going to go and get on the school buses. We're going to go play paintball. So I was like, oh my God, we're going to go play paintball. Nobody wants to do that. So they go play paintball. And at the end of the day, everybody comes back and they're all kind of like have various, you know, they have paint splattered on them. They're kind of injured by the balls a little bit, bruises all over, exhausted. And, and they notice that there are security guards everywhere and all their crap and boxes and the boss says hey everybody bad news you just got laid off but you know what when i get laid off i don't when i when i'm unhappy i don't get upset i dance the hokey pokey so we're all going to dance the hokey pokey you know to which i'd say you know like this has like overtones of like a only slightly less sinister version of like playing violin at auschwitz because it's like just completely nightmarish life, you know, having to dance the hokey pokey while there are armed guards around you, you know, and you're you're being escorted out of the premises. Uh, so, so there's that kind of insanity um, going on in post-Fordism as well, that in its own way is as evil and horrible as anything that happened under Fordism. Uh, and so, so let's say there's that kind of like transition you we can see here in these kind of various um, socio-cultural ways. Um, we'll again go back to Deleuze in the next course and, and talk in the next class and talk about some of that. Uh, when we go to Jameson, also in Harvey, but also even more in Jameson, uh, something else appears that's kind of important for the present day. And it's kind of like astrology for historians, let's say. Um, and it's called Kondraty of Waves. Um, it's an interesting idea because it's it's actually come up by um Nikolai Kondratiev, who is a um his names are spelled with V, but Kondratiev waves are spelled with two Fs. Uh, and Kondratiev, Nikolai Kondratiev, uh, Soviet economist uh, in the 1920s, comes up with this idea of these economic cycles. And Joseph Schumpeter, who is associated with uh, fairly right wing, I mean, not like crazy right wing, but like fairly, uh, let's say he, he's a model, he's like, read less on the left and more on the right, like if you were to read classic writings of, econ of economics you know, by taught by Milton Friedman, I'm sure he would have had you read Schumpeter. Uh, he, com he comes up with a concept of creative destruction. Um, uh, he's, he's a big, uh, he, so anyway, Schumpeter is a big uh, enthusiast of Kondratiev and creative destruction basically, uh, well, I'll, I'll mention it within, within a Kondratiev way. So Schumpeter, uh, one of these uh, Austrian, I think he's Austrian, not German, pretty sure he's Aust one of these Austrian economists who comes to the U.S. Um, at WW2, uh, super influential in developing economics here. Um, he they, So together, the kind of the kontratiev schumpeter model involves um, these waves, these long-term economic cycles that uh, in this case are apparently can be mapped by the rolling 10-year yield on the standard in 500, which is, this is an image from 2010. I, if any of you can figure out how to get a rolling 10-year yield for uh, that would actually extend to the present day, I'd love to see it. Um, but in any case, um, the Kondratiev waves include these kind of long-term cycles of between 40 and 60 years. Uh, they consist of alternating periods of growth uh, of, and, and decline. Uh, waves are just gen generally driven by massive technological breakthroughs, like the in the, each one of these in the development of the steam engine, uh, the introduction of railways and steel, uh, the autom autom electrification, chemicals, automobiles, uh, fossil fuels, then information technology, communications technology, which also has add nuclear to that. And then the last one, they had no idea in 2010, but I think it's, it's you know, you know, it also, we don't really know what when the Kondratiev wave 
when the new one would start or end. Um, that's something we can talk about in just a minute. But um, so there's these economic cycles with 40 to 60 year uh, time periods. Uh, generally marked by major economic crises. There are sub-crises within them. So let's say um, in between, uh, although the Great Depression doesn't, between the Great Depression and this kind of heyday of Fordism, the fourth Kondratiev wave, uh, there really isn't any serious economic crisis during that time. Um, what are you doing that? Why are you moving on your own? Stop that. I just said, did not say you could do that. Um, the There are there are definitely major downturns within these um, within these periods. So uh, that uh, there's, that are or there's are minor more minor downturns, not major ones. Uh, the so there's this typical phases. I think are obvious: upswing, uh, then prosperity, and then as you know, then recession, uh, depression, recovery. This is fairly typical to also to Keynesian economics that model. Um, the idea being that as people are making more and more money uh, during the rise, it, it actually becomes more harder and harder to make more money because the easy pickings are taken care of. And then also a lot of the kind of the tooling up for industrial production, like the construction of factories and so forth, that, um, that begins to get done. And then also factories become less efficient as they age. Um, so that begins, that also, also, uh, consumer demand becomes satiated, right? Um, so there's this whole era, this is also an era of heady financial speculation. Now that was my fault for sure. Um, and as markets become mature and saturated, you begin to have leading diminishing returns, financial speculation begins to break down and you have this downward slope. And then you have the crisis and yet the crisis is not such a, you know, is, is kind of key because that's the time of what Schumpeter calls creative destruction. That's when old industries come apart New industries, uh, new industries are launched, and old industries um, will go bankrupt or become irrelevant. Um, and um, so, for example, uh, we might look at um, sort of the decline of the American automobile industry in uh, in the late '60s into the 1970s. Uh, and actually, by by 1980, at the latest, Toyota uh, become with a more modern post-Fordist method of production becomes the world's uh, largest car, uh, car maker. Uh, the and, and also like I think at that point also even the largest car seller in the United States as well. No, I know mentioning the United States a lot, but it's so, such a dominant culture and country in all of this. Uh, so far, this may change soon. Um, the but but you know that has a lot to do with, with things as well. That there's also kind of during the rise out of that depth, we also see the rise of China and uh, the rise of of other uh, other countries as well. Uh, the so. You know, again, downturns, e even more minor downturns. It's unclear to me if twenty, if like two thousand, the global financial crisis was the beginning of a sixth Kondratiev wave, or, or what? You know, what is our financial crisis that just happened and so forth? But you know, the iPhone was released in two thousand seven, right? The apps was so right before the crisis or early moments. The app store for the iPhone, which is kind of key to that world, is uh, developed by. Um, a hacker called Sadia um, in 2008, uh, and the app. So, it, and its store is, uh, opens in March 2009. That's arguably the biggest innovation in the iPhone. Without that, we'd all be like using the five Apple um, Apple apps, and Android wouldn't have been would probably not have been developed. Nobody would have cared about this stupid thing. So, uh, so this is kind of something that happens during that downturn, right? Um, another writer who writes about this is Carlotta Perez, uh, Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital. She's kind of popular um, in investment circles, Silicon Valley circles around 20 years ago. So the problem with Kondratiev waves is, yeah, they're kind of astrology. And although um, although Eric Hobsbawm, of all people, says, um, he's an uh, important Marxist historian, says, that uh, says that the good, this is a quote from here, the good predictions uh, have proved possible on the basis of Kondratiev long waves, and this is not very common in economics. But this has convinced many historians, and even some economists, that there is something in them, even if we don't know quite what. So that said, um, you know, again, it's a little bit like astrology. How do you measure the data? Here's another set of these charts. Um, maybe, in fact, you know, maybe, in fact, the winter happened in much earlier. This is a totally different set of Kondratiev waves with a totally different um, situation now. Moreover, uh, two Russian state economists, um, uh, Klinov and Sidorov, 
know their initials, they don't know their first names, in a 2021 article suggests that, um, and I think very in a very interesting way, they suggest that new technologies and global competition may be radically reducing the length of these waves. So we may no longer be looking at 40 to 60 year waves, maybe looking at 20 year waves. Uh, again, you know, do these things even exist? It's not entirely clear, but uh, for Harvey they do, uh, for Jameson they do, but they and they are, but they also are interesting models to think about. That is, that to think about these these moments when, um, in, ter in, in terms of uh, their economic uh, determinism, right? Do you have any questions about any of this? I'm going to talk a bit about like bad architecture next. Get a little bit more comfortable here. You can always raise your hand at any point, you know, and you can also just throw stuff into the chat. Um, I can endlessly go on if you want, or or we can, you know, throw questions at you. Um, this is uh, Philip Johnson, who I wrote a lot about, um, reformed Nazi architect, uh, becomes very, very, uh, very popular in the uh, in the United States uh, in the 1970s. Um, literally, like he wrote like complete fascist Nazi texts in the 30s he, before he became an architect. Um, and I was like conveniently covered up. Uh, in any case, here he is on the cover of Time Magazine, 1979, holding the AT&T building. U.S. architects doing their own thing. Um, Jameson. So Jameson. Let's turn to Jameson now and like just look at him more broadly again. Uh, we could actually look at the individual pages of the text. James, in particular, really hangs together rather difficult in a difficult way, and and I think he has he really struggles with um, I think with with his with being coherent. I think there are a lot. I think Harvey's actually more much more systematic thinker than Jameson is. Um, Jameson's a much more philosophically oriented thinker, uh, but Harvey is. Uh, Harvey just, uh, let's say, knows less about culture, but that doesn't stop him from having a more coherent theory than Jameson. Uh, Jameson's theory, let's say, is, uh, although it has some superficial similarities, uh, it also sort of relies on just kind of observations he's made, which, hey, maybe that's all we're going to do. Still more than maybe I've done, you know, right? But he did, you know, he came wrote this book, became famous doing it. So in any case, uh, Jameson's writing in 1983, uh, a little bit before Harvey, about this material uh, in the New Left Review in, in this essay that then go, goes into becomes this large book. And he's really compelled also by um, by architecture, because architecture, just as a skyscraper is a symbol of modernism, uh, it also becomes a symbol of postmodernism and its massive change. Um, and while Jameson's a literary critic, this, again, it's always, actually, kind of has terrible examples of postmodernism in literature, uh, but... Uh, but it kind of makes sense for him in architecture, and that's why he becomes, I think, popular with architects himself. Uh, this is two moments, or, or a moment that begins begins postmodernism. So we're going to go even before Jameson. The, the origin, maybe there, there's a, there are books have been written about the origin of the term postmodernism. It doesn't matter. Uh, but in 1977, an architecture critic named Charles Jenks, a British architecture critic. It's really a critic. I mean, he, he was something of a historian, but this is kind of one of these kind of guys who really operated around like trying to sniff out cultural trends, sniff out not culture, but like formal trends and trying to put a whole lump, a whole bunch of architects together. And he kept doing these books like modern movements in architecture, late modern architecture, the biological in architecture. Um, I think there was one of fractals in architecture. There's all these books, one after the other. And um in 1977, he writes his most popular book, The Language of Postmodern Architecture. There's really no theoretical framework in it to speak of there at all. It's just again the work of a formalist critic. But um, in this case, he, he identifies the end of modernism um, as being on at uh, July 15th, 1972, with the demolition of uh, Minoru Yamasaki's Prut Ego housing in St. Louis, Missouri. That is that that demolition of that, he says, these modern buildings that have been lauded as being uh, a more sensible and sane way for the poor to live when they were built in the 1950s. The destruction of these these buildings, uh, these were, uh, this is the Pruitt Ego Housing Project. I'll, I can write that in for you. Um, oh, Ed has done it. Good job, Ed. Um, so, uh, this is, uh, and in fact, there's a, there, there are um, 
books written, sorry, uh, the other, yeah, there are books written about this. Um, I believe they're actually in Philip Glass's uh, postmodern film, Koyani uh, Scotsi as well. I think their demolition is in Koyani Scotsi. Um, in any case, this is the beginning, this is uh, July 15th, 1972. And what it speaks to for Jenks, and Jameson talks about this as well, is that this is the end of the utopian dreams of modern architecture. That is, it's the end of the belief in a kind of, in architecture being a Fordist solution for, um, for regulating life. In other words, if the people here are poor, they are uh, urban, uh, vast majority African-American, their neighborhood is destroyed, they're living in these places, uh, they're brought to these uh, shiny new buildings, except the buildings are never shiny, they're actually really crappily built, uh, and there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of cost cutting, the things are complete disasters from the start. Uh, Jenks points out that the uh, that the people who live there begin chant at a meeting begin chanting, blow it up, blow it up. This is a bit this is a bit of hyperbole. There's also a lot of revisionist history about how maybe these weren't so bad to live in. Maybe like, you know, this wasn't uh, this wasn't uh, exactly everything that's cracked up to be. And this can be seen everywhere. You know, you can go to Dublin. There's a oh, God, what's what are the Dublin estates that were torn down uh, just about you know all over Europe. Uh, in many many places throughout the world, this kind of this kind of event happens, and that uh, you know that uh, all over in, in England, a lot of these aren't torn down, but rather are turn, uh, the housing projects are turned into private uh, enterprises. Oh, this is continuing on to this day. Um, Cumbernauld Newtown, which I wanted to see in uh, when I was in Scotland this summer, um, has been um, uh, is is on is uh, on on the chopping ball. Uh, what is it? On the, is under threat by the wrecking ball. In any case, uh, for Jenks, this is the end of utopian, uh, the utopian dreams of modern architecture being able to solve societal problems, but, to, but he doesn't know it, but because Jenks doesn't think that way, but that's not just like a preposterous idea of modernist, it's actually comes out of a societal impulse to find ways of regulating society and putting and the people and having the people live in a more rational world. That is, if you live in a grid, if you live in a mathematical world of of an apartment building like this, you're living in a more, you're going to be living a more rational life than if you live in a townhouse, right? Because you're simply, it's like kind of a, you yourself become part of this diagram. It becomes even more obvious in the work of Corbusier. Uh, Corbusier, his book, uh, Vers in Architecture, published in 1923. Corbusier, one of the top, you know, most famous modern architects. Uh, he, he writes uh, this famous phrase, uh, architecture ou revolution, or architecture or, or revolution. Uh, a lot of people th would think reading that, oh, you know, just reading that, oh, does he mean like, you know, he's a revolutionary, is he a communist? No, not at all. He's exactly the opposite. This book is a pitch to industrialists to build modern, his buildings, because they will make people more rational. Like the buildings themselves will, their, their very form will make people more rational. Here he is pointing to the rational city of the future. This is the plan was in. Talk about an apocalyptic, doomerist idea. Um, this he actually proposed uh, that large area of Paris, like basically the center of Paris, like where all the tourists go now, um, would be wiped out and replaced by this logical uh, grid of skyscrapers. Uh, and there's his hand pointing to it because it's obvious, right? Here it is. Um, architecture or revolution, you take your pick. Which one do you want? The commies or my beautiful grid? Um, but again, you know, it's easy to make fun of him by this. Um, by the way, this also this plan was called the Plan Boisin, named after an aircraft manufacturer that he hoped to appeal to. Um, but he's also trying to solve the problems of capitalism and solve the problems of society with architectural regulation, right? Um, so that's his goal right there. And uh, reimagining Fortis life around the automobile and the airplane. Now, another writer, uh, Manfredo Tafuri, um, and um, Manfredo Tafuri, uh, Italian uh, historian, I just threw him in the chat, in his book, Architecture and Utopia, 1971, I think, um, writes... Um, comes up with a with term, actually even before that, in an article in 69, I think, in Contropiano, comes up with a phrase that I think is really important. He says, the reality of the plan, for in our, the reality of the plan supplants the ideology of the plan. Now, what does that mean? That means that what happens in the 1930s is that with Keynesian economics, 
with when you can begin to regulate the economy, right? You can begin to deal with things like, um, okay, you don't have that much poverty. You, your poverty is kind of alleviated to some degree, not too much, but you know you can alleviate you know, complete, you know, complete destitution by giving people some money in order for them to become productive members of society, which isn't just like a happy little term. It's rather they can be put to production. They can produce as opposed to not producing. Um, once that can happen, then you can begin to, th that, that the Keynesian regulation of society does everything that modern architecture claimed to do in a utopian manner. And so for Tafuri, that's what wiped out the modernist dream. All right. So Tafuri actually says, forget about leftist art, even though he's he's like the founder, of the most important Marxist in architecture thought ever. He says, forget about making leftist architecture. That's not possible. Just go and protest on the streets and write books about Renaissance architecture, which is what he does after. Uh, and so we can see this in architecture by the 1970s, Elder Rossi on the left, who's a friend of Tafuri's, uh, Charles Moore on the right, um, Elder Rossi, that's the Teatro del Mundo in, um, in Venice, that's actually 1980, for the Biennale, uh, a floating theater. There you have Charles Moore's Piazza d'Italia uh, um, in, what is that, about 77, in 78, in um, and maybe I, I, it's, I I've forgotten the date, but around then in um, New Orleans, both of which now introduce in very radical ways these historicizing elements. Uh, and in the case of Moore in particular, not only are they historicizing elements, these things from the past, but they're bound up with pop cultural references. Um, they're like this kind of shiny, uh, shiny chrome. And also there is, um, everything's kind of fragmented. So there's no more utopia. There's, in Moore's case, there's no more belief that things are going to be fixed, but rather there's a kind of permanent breakage to it. Um, this is kind of fragmentation is, becomes important to Jameson, as is the importance of these historicizing elements, which we're mentioning here. Um, but in art then, now we move rather quickly through, through things, um, more quickly than we were on that. Uh, in art, this is where, where the whole theories of postmodernism begin to really break down. Because in art, then how do you deal with that in art? Well, they're historicized. The art, the art movements, like again, think of Hal Foster and what he was doing to, uh, with with Rosalind Krauss to and, and the other members of October to cement the reputation of the pictures generation. Um, here they are, you know, on the left is uh, After Walker Evans by Sherry Levine. On the right, one of the untitled film still, stills by and of Cindy Sherman. Um, and this these now are meant to, on the one hand, they're point you know Sir Sherman pointing to the past, kind of a retro element, if you will. Um, Sherry Levine literally dealing with appropriation, just taking an, a section of one of um, Walker Evans's paintings. I, I could show you Richard Prince, except Richard Prince is copyright mad. So I, of all things, which is really ridiculous, I have actually encountered that before. Uh, you know, Richard Prince's work, he would take like sections of advertisements and the, that, that's a fair comment. Um, and and, uh, and I, that's actually what I, what I, uh, I actually posted the, when, when uh, I wanted to use one of his images, he wouldn't let me use his image, um, even though his image was actually copied from an advertisement and he actually sent a lawyer letter. So I actually used the image of the lawyer letter in this talk, in that talk that I gave somewhere in my in my, in my uh, documents. I find that it's kind of good. But the thing is that now what you begin to have is you now begin to have this world of um, of appropriation beginning to become more important and in art and art now now beginning to not only engage with a kind of a post-commercial world but also beginning to um to engage in this case with a kind of emergent in, in the case of this, this is what hal foster would call a postmodernism of resistance against against the hegemony of the of the society this is the emergence of a kind of identity critique happening here i could talk about that for too long and i don't really want to because it's like four o'clock's coming up I want to have a chance to talk with more of you about this. Um, again, Jameson's writing is a bit of a mess with all of this. I, and the more I think about it, but but it's just kind of seminal for that as well. Still, for talking about these periods, uh, he talks about a new depthlessness emerging with Warhol. And this is where things can begin to make some sense. So this is Warhol, um, it's a Mar Maryland thing. Um, again, Warhol, somebody literally trained as a commercial artist, literally worked as a commercial artist. And one of the first generation of people now breaking down distinctions in capital and art, calling his his um, his studio the factory, thinking of the work, appropriating industrial production, and yet, you know, in a kind of very post-forest manner, if you will. 
Jameson talks about a waning of effect. This is one of the things that, uh, one of the aspects of postmodernism that becomes important to him. Uh, and, and might be the kind of thing we might really want to begin thinking about. Like for Jameson, the aesthetic of expression itself has been eliminated. Um, expression and um, it presupposes a metaphysics of interiority and exteriority, an inside and an outside. But with capital permeating everything, including art, there is no more place for an inside and outside. There's a kind of to totality of capital. Um, for Jameson, postmodernism brings the end of the bourgeois ego, uh, an end to public and private. Uh, the unique and the personal have disappeared. They've all become part of this kind of mass produced, but also, um, but also com mass produced environment in which art is now mass produced. And that's, that's a big, a big difference. And once art adopts, thoroughly adopts, uh, the processes of, of capital, then what do you do? There's no more place. Artists can only, all Jameson says artists can do is really play with signifiers, play with surfaces. Um, and so for Jameson, pastiche becomes the dominant aesthetic mode, artistic mode. Um, so postmodernism becomes a dead language, but a dead language that's performing that deadness, a kind of endless recombination uh, of that deadness. So endless recombination of Maryland. You could begin, you could see that like, you could definitely plug in AI image generators into this framework, although I think there's more to them than that. Uh, but you definitely could say like, well, this is kind of, there is a certain degree of return to postmodernism with, with that. And another thing, thing that's very important for Jameson is the, this kind of, he talks about the, the breakdown of the signifying chain. We just talked about how all this left is signifiers, but so in other words, all this left is surfaces, no meaning behind everything, right? A signifier being just, just kind of surface forms and everything behind it and kind of meaning disappears. Here's David Bowie from the man who fell to earth watching, you know, the alien watching, uh, I don't know, like a hundred televisions at once. Um, so Jameson talks about the development of a kind of schizophrenic culture. Um, that is that following Jacques Lacan, he says that we have a breakdown in the signifying chain. There's no more clear, there's there's no more coherence in the uh, in our ability to map society. All we can do is kind of unleash this free play of signifiers. Uh, language is kind of this, this uh, nothing but uh, but this kind of or is, it, language is become, beginning to be this thing we can't make sense of. Life, life can't make we can't make sense of life anymore because everything is interchangeable now. Uh, there's a kind of hallucinogenic quality to all of this meaninglessness, uh, and yet a kind of real, um, a kind of a vividness too, a hallucinatory vividness. This is uh, David Cronenberg, Videodrome, again uh, from uh, from Jameson. And here, uh, here Jameson uh, also talks about uh, the technology now has something he calls the hysterical sublime. See how this stuff to some degree coheres around this for Jameson around this idea of the schizophrenia, this idea that capitalism is everywhere, but there's all that you can have now is signifiers. At the same time, there's a for all the many writings about Jameson, there's a kind of a real messiness to it that if you aren't making if this isn't making much sense to you, because I think it ultimately doesn't. I think that there is a degree of Unfortunately, there is a degree of um, of uh, breakdown within it. Um, so in this case, you know, but he says there's this thing called the history. He, he talks about the historical sublime. So postmodernism, he says, is um, a belief in the sub or a, a world as the world threatens to lose all depth and become nothing but a whirl of images in front of us. Um, the historical sublime shows up, which is simply like. The proliferation of technology and the proliferation of imagery and free-floating signifiers flipping, like if you imagine looking like the Manifold Earth, flipping the channels of an old TV to shows, not really watching the show, just seeing the images floating by. And that that itself is um, that kind of hysterical sublime uh, is something that dominates the world. Um, and for him, Cronenberg's uh, Videodrome, that many of you have seen, at least I'd seen it, uh, stands as a model for the pervasiveness of the network. This is a this is one in which the television, in Videodrome, there's kind of a cult around the TV, a, a particular sort of television, um, uh, television show, I think, and that, yeah, Siri just found television on the web, great job, um, that the television bleeds into reality and reality, uh, and then reality bleeds into the television. So you there's a kind of a loss of distinction between the individual and media. Um, 
and I remember, you know, even as a kid, like watching TV and like, you know, not being able to necessarily distinguish between where it's wondering where it stopped and where my life started, you know, five or something. Um, so that's, and, and maybe actually speak of kids who can't distinguish between themselves and uh, and everything else. And that, that process of not having any kind of critical distance anymore, right? That process of not being able to take a distance from the system, no room outside the system, he argues, that critical distance no longer has any kind of relevance anymore. Um, the kind of, the, in particular in terms of culture, the cultural sphere's semi-autonomy is destroyed by, the, by late capitalism. He's taking late capitalism from, um, oh God, oh, what was his name? Um, not Elietta, but the other one. Um, that's his book right here. Just, um, I'll, I'll remember, I'll, I'll toss it in the syllabus later. Uh, I'll probably remember like a minute later. But, um, but that uh, the idea of um, late capitalism as being this kind of this moment when capitalism is is has captured culture and culture has captured capitalism. They've bled through each other, and uh, at that point, um, the Ernest Mandel, by the way, right, is the writer on late capitalism, and. Um, so at that point, everything is cultural and everything in cap and culture is thoroughly capitalized. There is no more room outside that system, let's say. And if you think about like culture in the 19th century, when if you wanted to hear a popular piece of music, you'd get a sheet music and then you'd play it with your family on the piano, or you'd go to the bar and maybe have the, the person at the bar play it for you, you know, as opposed to the television, right? As opposed to um the um the world of uh completely permeated by media obviously you could there's some people who argue still that we're still in very much in postmodernism and that that all still um still continues it's now for i want to like take a pause in a, in just a minute but um if we wanted to talk about where postmodernism ends for me as i thought about it and I'm trying to think about what the kind of the bracket is and failed modern buildings. And I couldn't really come up with anything better than another Yamasaki building, which is rather insane because especially because it isn't really modernist, uh, but really postmodernist. It's a late modern building. And I, one of my many unfinished books is a book on, um, on, uh, on late modernist architecture. And in this case, the, um, the argument is um, that um, Yamasaki's World Trade Center, um, would, it does have various postmodernist elements in that it is very, it actually is historicizing. Um, these Gothic arches uh, may also, what happened here? Uh, these Gothic arches are very uh, on the facade, these historicizing elements, which were actually derided at the time. Um, there's a suggestion by an architect, Laurie Kerr, that they're actually. Um, um, in an article that that has had very little traction, but is nevertheless fascinating. Stop doing this. Stop touching my mouse. That um, Bin Laden would have very well known that that facade was based on was derived ultimately from his first work, uh, from Yamasaki's first work in uh, Saudi Arabia, King Fahd Duran Air Terminal, where he um, where he introduced this kind of ornamentation into his modern, into his architecture, this kind of structural filigree. Uh, moreover, the plaza between the two buildings was intentionally, um, was intentionally laid out like the, like the, um, the plaza in the mosque uh, in Mecca. Uh, it's, there are a lot of qu questions about that argument. At the same time, I think it's just the very fact that there is an ornament, a question of ornamentation here. Um, and is that there is there is a degree where where this could end for postmodernism. So let me since it's four now and we have right we have a half hour left. Um, we could go on. We could talk. Well, let me just talk about one thing before we I pause and hopefully we can talk about stuff. Um, so then that would be like a moment where something else is happening. And then you'd have to ask what happens immediately after nine eleven. And there are two things I'm going to point out because I think they're both really, to me, they're really interesting. One is the opening of the Standard Hotel uh, in Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles, which is a strange vote of confidence in this downtown 
after 9-11. Different city, doesn't matter too much though. Andrew Balash, the Standard Hotel. What's interesting about it is that it is no longer po that post postmodern form, and this is the only thing I'll show you of it. It's a re it's a redoing of a building, but it's enough to just see this kind of cheap, um, cheap mo neo modernism emerging that speaks to the kind of the infatuation with modern design that begins right around that has already latent. It's already happening, but is now really happening at the time. This is a picture from my book, Blue Monday, actually. And the reason, one reason it's there is because that building in the background, one Wilshire, that 1960s office building that is really banal and is really uninteresting is stuffed full of fiber optics at this point. That is, that building is now, by this point, is now the most connected place on earth. Um, it is, uh, it is a major landing point for fiber optics um, from throughout the world. Like, so if you were, if you were contacting um, Asia through from uh, New York City, you were doing, or, or or for that matter, from South America, or from Europe, you were very likely doing it through that building. Like, you're, if you're doing it through the internet or through phone, through the phone, so that um, that stands in the background. But we won't talk about that. But what what's important is that let's say although that is important. What's also important is that this is a place that is beginning to advocate for. Um, modernism again, a rejection of postmodernism. Postmodernism disappears very, very rapidly and without any real sadness. Um, and then the, the other side of it, which is also modernism, is the iPod, which is Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive. And it's to show you an image to show you that it's absolutely a copy of um, a 1950s Ohm school design um, uh, for a radio. And it's completely you know, based on Johnny Ives' neo-modernism. Uh, and it is actually released October 23rd, 2001. It's the first consumer product released after 9-11. It, it was seen at the time as a completely complete misstep by Jobs. Uh, MP3 players were popular then already. They were, they were commonly found um, with... Like with the with the U.S. Um, in you know kind of crisis mode, the whole world in crisis mode. One, this is a month and three weeks after, or a month and two weeks after nine, month and a week even after nine eleven. It seems like folly to be releasing a new consumer product, and yet it is released, right? Um, and the and it is it defines this early moment, which now you know kind of leads to in a certain sense the iPhone. Uh, it isn't networked yet, you know. The iPod isn't networked, but it's also not a Walkman. Uh, it's something that has this kind of overproliferation within it. Like a Walkman has a Walkman tape. You, know, you have one cassette, right? You can you can listen to one cassette. Uh, you can listen to a max of two hours of music. But with this, you could actually very swiftly you'd be able to listen to to have more music than you could listen to in a year in your pocket. Um, so that, and, and it also has another kind of curious feature that there's this moment in New York where people feel very close, right? And people like crime goes down a great deal. Uh, people will be crying in the streets. People come up to hug them, uh, you know, random people just because, you know, it's just this kind of incredible thing. You knew people who died. You can't go back to your apartment maybe ever again. Um, all these things have happened. People have experienced these things. And then soon after the release of the iPod, things come back to normal because those white headphones become a target for thieves because that means that the person has an iPod so you can easily mug them and take it back. So everything's good again. Um, now, here's what else is curious about this, Just to, and I'm gonna finish right here. Um, I'll just finish with the next slide. But what, what becomes curious is that the iPod is discontinued on May 10th, 2022, and the standard LA is closed on January 22nd, 2022. Uh, if you wanted an event that marked the end of this last period, the last 20 years, I suppose you just we should just take COVID or January 5th. Uh, but the last, the last, um, the last slide I'm just going to show you. It's a slide I took in Hong Kong, a photo I took in Hong Kong, uh, just because it speaks of, you know, it could be taken all sorts of places. Um, so it could be taken in New York as well. But it just um it speaks of like a massive change in society. We're now starting in the 2000s, suddenly uh, developed countries, but even undeveloped countries, even Africa, even, you know, poor people throughout the world. Now, 85% of the world's population owns some kind of mobile phone. Uh, the numbers in the 2010s were, were low, but lower, but they weren't that low. They were still a lot. Uh, almost all the world's internet usage is, on, is mobile. Um, People walk around 
with things in the area is talking to people, uh, or they did. Not many people are talking to people on their on their over their phones anymore. People are texting more often. But we're living like as if we we're living in a kind of medieval world, you know, where we believe in voices from a you know we hear voices from the ether. You know, we hear like in the medieval world, you might have like said you hear the words of God or the angels are talking to you, but now you hear like you know your friend is talking to you in your ear. You know, you don't know like you walk down the street, somebody in the two thousands. I had I literally had this experience. I was walking down the street and there was a man who was muttering to himself and I thought, oh, gee, you know, this guy is, um, you know, I'm, 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 this guy's crazy. And I said, stop it. He's not crazy. He's talking on a Bluetooth phone. You don't need to cross the street. It's okay. And then as I walked by him, he started talking about Satan to me. Like, so I was like, oh, okay, he is crazy, but you don't know like anymore. Like, you know, so, but yet people are talking to this other world, as if we have all collectively gone mad. And I think we should actually save this um, this for the beginning of the next class. I, want, I don't think it'll take very long, um, but I want to finish with this and like ask you, like, okay, we've still got twenty minutes. Um, what do you want to talk about with regards to this? Uh, I could pose you some questions, um, but more likely, I'd rather you pose me or each other questions. I could even, should I stop my sharing? I could do that. Then you might just be staring at my face. How about that? So now you're staring at me. Um, I'll just go ahead if that's okay. Sure. Um, yeah, my name's Sam. I'm I'm in Los Angeles, so I I thought it was uh, I hadn't read that text before uh, from um, I don't know, blank, was it a blank on his name, but the the, the postmodernism guy. <laughs> and it's um, thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. And so I, I I think it's really funny when people go off on um, the the bon and now it's called the Western Bonaventure Hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I didn't I mention really, that, I, but you know, part of it, yeah. Yeah, I actually really love that building. But yeah, um, I, but I think... <laughs> I stayed there once. I, wonderful. I, I, was it? I've actually been wanting to do a staycation there, like, forever. Um, but um, I guess, yeah, I, when I when I first saw, like, the reading list on this, I was just like, oh, man, is this going to be a class about postmodernism? <laughs> and yeah, I was, we're, like, we're bracing, postmodernism today. bracing myself a little bit. So, like, I'm glad to hear we're kind of starting off of a critique of it. And, and like, yeah, I guess... Um, just one thing that stood out to me from that, it, it, the reading and, and sort of what I like hope maybe can kind of prime, at least for sort of my, my thinking in this class is, um, like, yeah, so <clears throat> there actually was this, uh, movie that came, I actually, well, I watched it on YouTube, like before I moved to LA, uh, five, six years ago, it's from the eighties. I thought, I thought it was, um, that guy, who's the guy? The British documentarian who makes all those like found footage archival documentaries. Oh um, yeah, 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 um, yeah. It's uh, Adam Curtis. Adam. Well, it it looks like an Adam Curtis movie, but it's actually not. It's like someone trying to like make an Adam Curtis movie, and it's called like Los Angeles: Colon City of the Future or something like that. Wow. And um, probably from the eighties. I'm not sure which of these texts came first, but like he's just totally. There's a whole there's a whole middle part where he's like dunking on the Hotel Bonaventure, um, and. And I guess like one thing that really um, annoys me about that, especially as I've gotten to know the building a little better and sort of as it's contextualized in downtown LA is that um, it's like, uh, there, there's sort of this like double standard that I think a lot of people who criticize post-modernity um, employ, which is like on the one hand, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that, uh, that the the text we read, and then also this movie is like Bonaventure doesn't make any sense because like you get lost in it, and then yeah. you you can't find these stores, blah blah blah. But like, but then also, you know, and like Jersey City, you can't even you can no one can navigate Jersey City. It's like okay, but but like, there's also like I feel like those same people would critique cities like Phoenix, uh, which is like in the US, Southwest US, there's like hyper grid. It's like super gridded, very kind of suburban uh, as being like too rigid, right? As being like uh, over, overly, uh, like overly legible. And then and that, that being a problem as well. So I think like one of the interesting things uh, that, I, that I see in this is that like, 
or one critique, I guess, would be how, um, yeah, like it, it just is like it's still just sort of a lot, a lot of what postmodernity does is it seems to just be like designed to just dunk on on things that like a lot of people like, you know, like uh, maybe not so much anymore, but Hotel Bonaventure and a lot of people like living in Phoenix, Arizona. So it's just, I don't know. I think it, it's a little bit of a sort of like a uh, um, kind of confirmation bias, I guess. And so I'm kind of like interested to see uh, how the next text will go. We'll, yeah. we'll move from there. Yeah, I guess rather briefly, I mean, in case you either didn't read the text or didn't read, didn't, or for that matter, didn't, uh, didn't see the, don't know what the Bonaventure looks like. We'll pull up a couple of shots of it for you, actually. Um, it's actually not even a, it's again, one of these things, not even a postmodern building. It's actually a modern building. Um, it's this um, set of towers that um, are these, these mirror glass towers in downtown LA. Uh, John Portman, he builds uh, buildings like this uh, throughout the, here, that's the experience, uh, in various parts of the U.S., Detroit uh, and Atlanta are, are typical. It was kind of by this urban renaissance moment. Uh, one of the things, and this is actually a deceptive shot because it's from a plaza, is that the Jameson points out is it's really, you, there's really no entrance to it from the street or there wasn't until it was rebuilt. There's a very bad, grim entrance really meant to be driven in from the highway. And he talks about the hype, a postmodern hyperspace within it. So this is the interior. Um, I'm pretty sure it's going to be actually in a show today called uh, Silo, which is based on the Hugh Hoey uh, book, um, Wool. I'm not 100% sure, but I think I read some of it was filmed there, which would be kind of a perfect spot because that's about a dystopian world where everybody lives in a kind of a skyscraper underground uh, because the earth has been destroyed by nuclear annihilation. Could be wrong on that. I may have, I may have confabulated that. But that'd be perfect. Um, I actually do love, again, I say I love the building. But that said, um, you know, at the time, I think the building wasn't very popular. So I think that it's it's kind of clear, uh, you know, it's kind of like something that can be talked about with that. But but I think the point about it is that that Jameson's making as well that I didn't get into is he he sees cognitive mapping or trying to locate yourself within within the world as being the only the only possible thing you can do really within like capitalism that or produce art in terms of an allegory, which in turn also is cognitive mapping. Uh, again, you know, I feel that the more I look at James, it's like a whole bunch of things thrown together, really seductive at the time, um, but I don't really buy it very much. Um, so in fact, what's, what's actually really strange about the Bonaventure is if you actually look at the plan, it's incredibly sensible. It's just like, it's like an incredibly symmetrical and logical plan. It's just when you walk around it, yeah, you kind of get lost and that's what it is. Um, but yeah um yeah it's there it is um and uh i'm, I'm gonna miss i'm sorry if i mispronounce your name my you know my with my name i mispronounce my names all the time um karas we do a, yes uh, hey it's Harris. Karis. Karis. yes yes i should know better <laughs> <laughs> no worries no worries at all um i wanted to ask about the um connection between form and function mm. um, because it's um, like form follows function in modernism and sure. also in some sense in Fordism and then in post Fordism we see this breakage uh, but what could we say about this connection uh, after the end of postmodernism yeah. and maybe even architecture so I guess what I, what, the way I would look at it from an architectural perspective, and I, I don't think this course is going to be really touching on architecture very much at all, although I do know a bit about it, I guess, because I taught in it for 20 years, but um, but I, I'm, this was kind of the most architecture I planned to show during the course was right today, um, just just because of what was so dominant in the discourse in postmodern, which speaks also, let me just take it aside, that also speaks of architecture as being something that was the focus for theorists of postmodernism. And actually, by the way, right now, let me just say something right now. I think architecture right now is like, Hegel would say architecture for us is a thing of the past. Like it is, architecture is so far out from any kind of conventionally, like any kind of contemporary discourse. That's the way I feel, you know, maybe one of you as an architect can tell me complete, that's complete bullshit, that's great. But right now I, I feel- when I agree. Maybe, different from it. But what I would say, and this is why I ran the Network Architecture Lab, what I would say is, okay, so under modernism, form follows function for sure. 
the the function also is something that regulates the user right the user bec the world becomes clear to you because you're in the grid right whether it's the factory the office um the school uh this is now back to Deleuze, the, the, the Deleuze reading for next week, the, the, the factory, the, the barracks, he's, 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 sorry, he's like the hospital, the school, the barracks, the factory, there's a kind of constant procession through institutions, those institutions are, uh, and, and the house as well, you know, whether it's a house in a, like, prude ego, like, you know, housing development, or whether it's in a suburb, you know your place, right? You are organized, you're in a graph, you're literally living in a graph, right? That's, that's kind of like, say, the modernist ideal of, you know, but then under postmodernism, what begins, let's say, say there's a certainly that's completely fragmented, that utopianism is gone, but what begins to happen is form is desire, right? So you're, you're desiring, your, your desire for, we're, your desire, whether it's for Pepsi or for uh, depraved uh, hair uh, hair goop, or your desire for you know a postmodern building, suddenly everything is imbued with culture. But what I would say that happens after after the end of postmodernism is that architecture gets to be architecture is no longer the prime location for locus for space that is throughout history once you start making buildings architecture had become you know the spatial organization of buildings was a really important part of human life but once you have once you can begin to dwell in this space right the space of the um the space of technology the space of something that you can take with you here it goes well it's kind of amazing right it like disappears i'm disappearing it's kind of great um but you know this is what i mean the stupid thing that actually won't appear on my zoom background uh pre-cambrian like a would call cthulhu eats my phone um once that phone that um is begins to be once once other spaces begin to be dominant, whether it's sitting at the desktop still and, you know, dialing into the internet, like at least at broadband speeds, being able to inhabit other spaces that way, inhabit chat rooms, inhabit 4chan or Twitter or Facebook. People think more about those spaces in their lives than they do about any architectural spaces. Uh, but so in other words, there's a kind of an over, a spatial overlay that's emerging now. Uh, or that emerged sort of in the 2000s uh, that had not existed previously. Like example, I moved to a, a suburb outside of New York because I couldn't afford to live in New York with two kids. So my father-in-law was like, oh, that's great, the train, you'll get to play cards with the guys on the train. I was like, John, are you out of your mind? I'm gonna be in my laptop working all the time on the train. Because he had no idea that that would have been something you could have done, you know, when he was, you know, traveling on the train, he was a pilot, so, but, you know, in the, in the 70s or 80s, you know, he wouldn't have never done that. He would have thought, oh, yeah, I'll just play cards with the guys, but you don't do that. Everybody's, like, got the earphones in, everybody's working on their laptop or, you know, uh, you know commute, text messaging somebody about uh, about the latest goings on in Wall Street. So I think that, that to me, that's the overlay. Go on. You had your hand up again? Or, or is it just still up? You're muted, by the way. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm okay. Uh, thank you. And I think that's a really important break that I didn't really mention. I think that's a really good point, is that there is that kind of, that space begins to be, if you will, you know, there is a kind of belief in, you know, in the ether or the angelic that begins uh, around 2000, in the not of this world, in the people dwelling in multiple spaces. And someone next to you on the train, you know, is occupying one space and you're occupying another. And you're not, your physical proximity matters very, very little compared to your um, your telematic proximity, you know. Um, where is this person? Are they in the, are they in, are they in the, in the space that I'm inhabiting? Are they in there at all? Um, you know, so I think that, that that that's a very, very important break with postmodernism. And while there is certainly a huge explosion starting in the 90s with Bill Bao, um, there's a huge explosion in production of building, of cool buildings, right? Uh, when the time the Bonaventure is being built, there are these kind of downtown skyscrapers. There's a real obsession with stadiums. Um, 
But there's Richard Florida begins writing about creative cities in the 1980s. The idea that cities are cities are creative. That's where gay people live. This is very important for Richard Florida. Gay people live in cities and you want to employ gay workers because they're creative and you need to make happy places for gay people. This is literally his argument. He's gay, but he's literally his argument. It makes sense. You know, it's used to make nice spaces for with tolerance, but that's his art, but that's his argument, it's the economic one. And this is over in the 1990s. And he's saying, like, if you do that, then you know, then um you create that kind of cool neighborhood, then you're gonna get cool businesses that are like, you know, creative, creative industries, and that's what you want. And everything became a creative industry for Florida, uh, virtually. And so then you have mayors are like, instead of like, oh, I need a stadium, they're like, oh, I need to have cool museums because I need to have uh, I need to have a gay neighborhood, something mayors wouldn't have wanted in the 1960s and 70s, right? Uh, maybe it's positive in that sense, but otherwise, again, a kind of capitalization of sexuality as a, as a culture as well. But, but in his case, you know, there's this kind of explosion of creativity in the city, again, that and, and the Bonaventure is right next to actually the Disney Concert Hall, which is, let's say, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, it was supposed to be built before Bilbao, but it was finished after. Uh, and so there's that kind of effect. Again, based in a very, and again, I'm trying to get a little bit away from capital controls, everything, but this is based on a very heavy capitalization of, um, very heavy capitalization like Bill Bow is just billions of dollars of money being funneled into this one place that makes a huge difference uh in in the future of that place so that's that's very important as well uh for um um for um for the the world of uh post 2000 the world of network culture is that that's happening in architecture and then that begins to wane as the cool buildings Every place has a cool building. Bill Lithuania has a leafskin building. Who's going to go just to see another leafskin building? Who's going to go see another Frank Gehry building? Uh, and as we begin to have the rise of social media, we begin to have that kind of the end of, let's say, that coolness, that architectural coolness um, being so dominant. Um, the other thing that happens actually in architecture as well that I noticed, and one reason I really stopped teaching in architecture schools was, uh, you know, a lot of people, the replacement for architecture Hey, let's think about what architecture is. Architecture is a place in which um, individuals are, or it's ar architecture schools are places where individuals who are interested in art and artistic things, creative things, and making some money, not too much, because you don't make much money as an architect, um, go, you know, like the typical like person, like, you know, like me, it was like, ah, I want to do art, but my father, which is an artist, was an artist, he would be like 106 now, he was alive. He was like, oh, yeah, you can't ever be an artist. I won't ever let you. You can't do that. Yeah, okay, well, there goes college. Um, but you know, if you're an architect, okay, that's not so bad because you can make money as an architect. Okay, but you can't really make that much money as an architect. But you know, as we all found out. But the point was that kind of largely got supplanted. That pool of talent got supplanted by the startup because now, starting in the two, starting around uh, the twenty uh, twelve or so, I began to really notice that. Uh, there were a lot, a lot less. Oh, somebody says, are you sure he's gay? Yeah, maybe he's not. Yeah, who knows? Um, but uh, I, I thought he was. But in any case, big, big advocate of gay neighborhoods. And, and again, that positive, positive thing. Uh, but um, but <laughs> he's married to a weird business influencer. Not surprising. Well, he's a weird business influencer. In any case, in fact, that makes more sense because actually, to tell you the truth, it would be talking to mayors that would actually it's easier to convince them of the need for a gay neighborhood if you're a straight guy than if you're a gay guy, to be honest. Um, like uh, an aside, um, yeah, who cares? It's, it's public, I don't care. Uh, muse uh, museum curators are a lot of gay, uh, of, uh, gay people or museum curators, but museum directors, there are very few, uh, especially the top levels. And this, is, this, this was as recently as 10 years ago, something that and I've never been, and I'm talking about the U.S. and, and, and England. I'm not talking about about much anywhere else. But uh, I've actually, you know, spoken to people who are at that level, and they're like, "Yeah, yeah, they're actually so and so had to have a test. They brought his wife to see if they actually knew each other. That's how kind of nefarious it is, right? This is not. This is like ten years ago. This is not twenty years ago. This is like somebody who's still a museum director in New York City right now. Um, I don't care. I mean, find it on find it on YouTube. It's fine. Um, but um, but it also speaks of the kind of the hypocrisy culture still to this day. In any case, um, the point is that uh, because of course those people have to deal with all sorts of like like people who are like 
you know, CEOs who might might have issues. I don't know. Anyway, um, the point is that so the but again, all of this is like in service of finding way of finding ways of having creative industries make money, right? Um, and also that architecture begins to come aground when it's replaced by when the when the spaces the most interesting spaces being created are no longer physical. Um, and whether it's at a startup or whether it's at, um, you know, um, or whether it's in some kind of other um, other realm, right? Um, so I think that's rather interesting. It kind of goes, and this is why there's a certain degree of, of theology and I'm really not anybody interested in personally in any way in religion or theology. Uh, there's something where there is a kind of a theological discourse underneath a lot of this is because there is other realms. Right. It's 430 now. Uh, if you want to continue, we certainly can. But I also understand that a lot of you will want to go because this is the build time. And do we see is, is the new center is still here? What are you doing? Uh, if you have any more questions, I'll be glad to talk to you about this. Um, or we can jump and, and meet up next Friday. Hello, new center. You, you're still mute. You're muted. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think we can, uh, if there is no questions, we can uh, yeah. also continue in the Discord. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I do, I'm still doing a lot of work in Discord, whether it's uh, for actual art or whether it's just stupid goofing off making like, lately I've been making like 19, uh, 1970, 1960s uh, space planes, because I discovered it does really good versions of those apocalyptic space planes to destroy the world just for fun. That's like what I do at 1 a.m. in the morning. I can't sleep. Um, but, uh, you know, whatever, you know, I, so I spent a lot of time in Discord. So if you put anything into our chat, I will see it immediately. Um, maybe not immediately. I will see it soon. Uh, in fact, so, um, so yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good place to talk. You can email me. Uh, you can either email me at the new center address or you can email me at uh, kazis at barnalis.net. Um, that's fine too. Um, yeah, so you can get in touch with me that way. I'm really looking forward to talking a lot more starting uh, with you guys because we're going to be actually begin with introductions from you at the next class. And I'll give you like a, a little kind of overview of some of the network culture stuff we're talking about. I'll see if I can find that Sterling video because it's really great. Talk about that. And the next class was kind of always intended to, to deal with a lot of these topics while also really getting into the breaking points of network culture and where it falls apart. So I hope I'll see you there next week. Um, and that's it. And it's actually really ideal because... Um, I think it's time for all of us to go. So, yeah, worth Thank it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye.